So this morning we have, uh, before the coffee break at 10.30, we have a couple of presentations. Um, Marcus Hart, Diana, and Gabriel will talk to us about SFH with Federated Identity. Uh, and then that'll be followed by Jens Jensen uh, talking to us about token-based access to HPC resources in the IRIS infrastructure. Um, and then after our coffee break, uh, Lee Liming or his designated uh, alternative, we're hoping uh, he, he thought he might have some trouble. Um, he wasn't feeling well this weekend, but uh, he was. If he's not here, then he's designated somebody else to give his presentation. And that'll be about Globus integration and specifically with NIH's researcher authentication service. Um, and then uh, at 40, we'll have uh, Jim, Dave, and Mine talking about what's going on with LIGO and Fermilab uh, and their efforts to migrate from GSI authentication to uh, token based authentication. Uh, and if we're not completely exhausted by them before one, uh, we'll have some time to chat amongst ourselves about what your needs and interests are. Uh, and what... welcome all. Uh, and with that, I think I will uh, ask everyone, since this is a workshop, to briefly introduce yourselves. Um, Jim, you want to get that started? Hi, I'm Jim Basney from Custom CI and Side Tokens and CI Lock. Martha Kings, I work for SERP, which is the Research and Education Network of the Netherlands, but I'm currently in a role with my uh, JL Network. This is the European Research Education Network, and I'm working on policies there for trust and identity. Uh, Josh Drake, I am with uh, IU OmniSoc. I'm with OSG and Trust and CI. Uh, Rob Casey, the Director of Cyber Infrastructure at Iris Sage. We deal with seismology data. I'm uh, David Crooks from UK Research and Innovation, STFC in the UK. Um, and I'm representing uh, EGI CSERT and WLCG security, and also uh, UK digital research infrastructure cybersecurity as well. Uh, Jim Berhalter, Director of IT at the National High Magnetic Field Lab. Shane Phyllis, uh, Pittsburgh System Computing Center, Custom CI, and Access. Randy Trudeau, LIGO, um, Information Security Officer, and IT Manager. I'm Eric Cross, uh, I'm the head of information technology at the uh, National Solar Observatory. In Boulder, Colorado. Eric Scott, uh, UNC and uh, CR Compass. Uh, Doug Ertz from uh, UNAVCO in Boulder, Colorado, um, and uh, software manager for uh, NIT. I'm Tom Parton. I'm mostly retired. See some from the University of Chicago. I still work with Internet too in the Common Main Federation. I'm Chris Wilson, I'm head of IT operations for the National Optical Infrared Research Lab in the lab, and I'm based in Chile. Uh, Jim Hughes, I also work in Chile with, uh, with uh, Chris, and I work with uh, cybersecurity. Yes. Can we you? I'm Robert Hancock, I work for Haven National Laboratory. I do a bunch of different stuff, but uh, I'm an information, system, information system security officer for SDCC, as well as doing all the storage and some development work, and I'm rolling out our token transition right now. So this will be a good lecture. Excellent. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, if we have Marcus, Diana, or uh, Gabriel ready, I will relinquish the, uh, the sharing to you. And uh, <clears throat> Hi, uh, I hope you can hear me and see me well. Great, so yes, I will present today. And I hope you can see my screen. Perfect, thank you. Great, so yeah, to maybe introduce ourselves as well. So we work uh, for the SEC, the Computing Center for the Cultural Institute of Technology that's uh, in Germany. And we work with the uh, Federated uh, AIs uh, for various European national um, projects. And today I wanted to present our work on enabling SSH access with uh, OpenID Connect tokens. All right, so um, maybe to give a bit of background why we did what uh, this work. So we um, 
were motivated by the need to uh, integrate shell-based services into federated uh, research infrastructures. Since with federated identity management nowadays, uh, we usually mean OpenID Connect. Um, a lot of uh, services, web-based services can support this out of the box, but with shell-based services, things are a bit more complicated. And uh, SSH, the service that we chose to focus on actually has uh, even uh, additional, let's say, layer of complications. So the, uh, there are two kind of major challenges that we saw there. And one is that SSH requires um, local identities um, to exist on the server and these local identities need to exist at uh, login time. And uh, SSH has specific um, um, yeah, auth uh, authentication mechanisms like passwords and keys that have their um, quite a bit of drawback. So we know from experience that users tend to maybe share their SSH keys or managing the keys is quite complex or on the server side as well, managing uh, new credentials that need to be revoked in, in case of security incidents is, um, is quite complicated. So. Uh, there was this need to um, to use federated identities for uh, for SSH as well. So our solution uh, that we came up for uh, with for this problem uh, is to actually uh, not modify any of the SSH uh, software and uh, develop additional server and client side tools that can work alongside um, the standard SSH software. And these tools um, use um, YDC tokens to authenticate and authorize the users and um, as well um, manage the local identity. So the life cycle of this local identities, how they are provisioned and how they are mapped to the federated identities. And I will talk a bit about how uh, this works today and also show you uh, a bit uh, on the practical side. But before that, I wanted to actually answer the, let's say, um, obvious question. So why would you use our solution? And we have this from the point of view of the user is quite convenient since you get the single sign on um, um, advantage. So you can use your federated identity to log into um, a bunch of different services and you don't need additional credentials that you need to manage for each service in particular. You also don't need to register for each service in particular or even uh, manage any manage um, any SSH keys for um, logging into these services. From uh, the service provider point of view, of course, you get all the benefits of um, using a federated AI. That means the identity management part is offloaded to the home organization, so you don't need to deal with um, um, users and onboarding them and checking their um, identity and also offloading the authorization management part to the federation itself. So uh, mechanisms like uh, virtual organizations uh, that probably we're familiar with are kind of handled at the federation level. And then our solution bridges this gap between federated and local identity by um, managing this mapping from um, between these two identities, but also the life cycle of local accounts. So creating them, updating them with the relevant information and um, managing the access control uh, based on federated authorization models. So for example, the virtual organizations that um, uh, I mentioned. And in addition, we, um, it uses OpenID Connect based authentication. That means that the service provider does not need to manage additional credentials um, for each uh, local account. That means you don't need to deal with resetting passwords in case the user needs to do that or revoking um, keys or getting the users to upload the SSH keys to log into their uh, local account. And this is kind of makes um, uh, let's say increases security in terms of um, yeah when we have security incidents um, on the federation level things are easier to trace and control. Right, so kind of in one picture this is how um, our approach looks like, and we see here the access token is uh, an important piece of um, of the puzzle and it's used uh, everywhere and. Um, so how this works is on the server side, we have a custom PAM module um, that does the authentication of the user using um, by prompting for an access token. And then we added uh, an additional um, REST interface to manage all these details around it. That, um, so that's called Motley Q and it does, for example, the validation of the token for PAM or the provisioning of the local account, 
checks the authorization uh, of the user and so on. And then on the client side, um, we um, have uh, additional, um, so we need an additional way to obtain access token. And for that, we use the OIDC agent. This is kind of um, similar to the SSH agent where you can manage all your um, identities and retrieve uh, new valid uh, access tokens. And um, then we enable the SSH client to use tokens by providing wrappers or plugins um, that kind of um, can communicate with the server and uh, do this kind of wrap around all this functionality for you. But the important part here is that we do not modify the SSH or SSH uh, daemon um, software in any way. Right, so let's look a bit um, in more detail how um, this looks on the server side. As I mentioned, the uh, Motley Q is um, uh, mostly, so it has four um, main components. Uh, the first one is the REST API that I talked about, and this is um, accessible with your YDC token as the bearer token. And then here you have all the um, user related uh, operations like deploy or getting information about your local account, but it's also used by the PAM module to uh, verify um, the username and the token that it receives uh, on SSH login. And then we have an authorization layer, a layer that does the identity mapping between federated and local identity. And finally, uh, interface to the local identity management system. So in this case, we uh, kind of try to uh, change as little as possible the way the system administrators uh, kind of manage their users. So we want uh, to integrate with existing solutions and forward, for example, all the um, provisioning or update um, operations on the user to the local identity management um, system through a series of uh, plugins that um and yeah, that kind of um kind of do this for you so to go a bit into more detail uh for these components for the authorization uh this is uh, i would say quite uh, straightforward at the moment we uh so we want to authorize users based on kind of federated um, authorization models so we, you can configure multiple OIDC providers that are supported on the server. And for each provider, uh, you can authorize um, users that are, for example, part of, uh, only users that are part of certain VOs or that have a certain level of assurance. Or you can also have a list of users that are allowed based on their unique identifier on the federation. So subject issue claim from, um, from OpenID Connect. Of course, this can be, extended to support more complex um, authorization models. But at the moment, uh, this is uh, how it works. Uh, the account provisioning, as I mentioned, it's only an interface to the site local identity management system. So we it's quite extensible. And we already developed a few uh, plugins for that. So uh, we call them um, backend. So we can provision Unix accounts or um, LDAP accounts or uh, our own, um, let's say, custom um, system that we have here at the Castle Institute of Technology called the REGA. And this can be um, extended and we are willing to support if you are interested in that. So how, at, also at the, this layer here, we have the identity mapping. So, um, the federated identity that's um, uniquely identified by your subject and issuer is mapped to a local username. And this mapping itself is stored directly in the local, um, your local user management system. So uh, the way that is done is, is then backend specific. Let's say if you have Unix account, then you store your um, uh, federated unique identifier in your in the geckos field in etc password or in LDAP you store it in an additional attribute that you can configure and in this way it's kind of decoupled um, the user management system from Motley Q itself and then you have all this information um, in your um, local system and of course the challenge here is we have um, 
uh, a namespace that needs to be uh, quite often reduced since Unix accounts are much shorter. And also we want, uh, they have to also be unique, of course, but we also want them to be, let's say, uh, user-friendly in some ways so that we don't generate just random um, um, strings. So we have um, different ways to uh, generate usernames um, when you uh, when you log in. And um, so, so far we support two different strategies. One is a friendly username generation. That means uh, if you have a preferred username option at the supported at the OP, then uh, we try to use that or some kind of combination of your first last name or yeah, different variations on that until we find something unique. Or we also support um, the pooled accounts. That's kind of a concept from uh, from Grid. Um, yeah, where you can have, let's say, a prefix and um, uh, different numbers uh, for your user. And the same is uh, done for the virtual organizations. The uh, local groups are created for each uh, VO and uh, there as well, local groups are um, kind of um, names are determined for each view. We also have, uh, I wouldn't go too much in detail, but we also have additional features that um, we've developed more recently. Well, one of them is we support an approval workflow. This was, um, yeah, it came out of, um, uh, say, use case from uh, from HPC. So the idea was to have uh, local sysadmins oversee all deployment requests so that um, accounts are not uh, created automatically, but um, admins are notified by email, for example, that a certain user wants to create an account and then they can accept or reject this, um, this request. Um, as I mentioned, the LDAP backend, we have different modes there where you also have a read-only uh, option if if necessary to pre-create all the accounts by yourself or fully populating the LDAP. Well, we support uh, audience um, settings, so restricting access to tokens that are released only for configured audiences, of course, if the OP itself supports it as well, and a uh, feature to um, uh, support long tokens since SSH um, does not allow, it, allow passwords longer than uh, one kilobyte. We have a way to deal with that as well. Um, besides the um, uh, monthly queue service, uh, the PAM module, um, as I mentioned, it's a custom module. It was developed at uh, PSNC. That's uh, the computing center in uh, Poznan in Poland. And uh, the PAM module um, is able to prompt for an access token instead of a password. And then it queries the monthly queue API to kind of, um, yeah, to validate um, the token. So checking if the username uh, matches with the one that's mapped to, to the federated identity given by the token and also if the um, the user is authorized to, to access the resource. A bit on the technical side, um, so we were really focused on making this um, software kind of easy to deploy and use. So that's why we provide packages for the most common dist Linux distributions. So both for Motley Q and for PAM and um, uh, integration with systemd. So it's quite simple to set up. You need to install two packages that also um, install all the configuration files in the right places. You can edit the, um, the authorization of users, restart the service, and it's uh, um, up and running, and um, you can SSH into the server. If you're interested um, on how this is implemented, have a quite a few uh, summary here, but it's all based on, on Python. We use Fast API, and we also have uh, an Nginx as a reverse proxy. So it's this is also installed um, as a dependency on uh, uh, with the packages. And a few nice to know features. So again, reiterating that we don't modify the SSH daemon. You only need to uh, change some configuration. So to allow keyboard interactive uh, authentication. And you, since it's PAM, then you, uh, that means you can always combine it with uh, other PAM modules. And you can, for example, think of um, 
using second factor authentication as an additional PAM module, or of course, you can still use the SSH keys um, at the same time with uh, uh, with this with the OIDC based authentication. So that was on the server side. Uh, on the client side, we actually uh, developed here um, wrappers and plugin that help you uh, log in. So how this looks on um, Linux and Mac OS, you have to do two simple changes to your uh, to your SSH command. Um, so instead of providing um, your username, you provide your federated identity with, for example, uh, yeah, OIDC or um, providing the token directly. And here again, we have um, uh, to install two additional tools. One is MCCLI, our uh, wrapper tool here, and the other one is the OIDC agent, where again, we provide packages for all the major operating systems. Of course, the OIDC agent is um, optional. If you can obtain a token in any other way, you can also um, leave that out. Right, so on Windows, everything is a little bit different and more complicated. So uh, for Windows, we actually focused on um, a party to uh, introduce support there. And it was necessary to do source code modifications to Putty itself. So for that reason, we worked together with the Putty main developer, with Simon Tatham, and developed a general plugin interface that can be used for any plugin that wants to do keyboard interactive authentication. And this uh, interface will be available in the main um, party release in version um, 078. So at the moment it's not available, but there is a pre-release um, available there. And what we did, we developed a plugin and um, yeah, we also want this again to be easy to use. So we shipped it together with the OIDC agent and you have a simple installer to to install um, both tools on Windows. All right, so um, what happens on the client side, it, of course, um, it, this is all, uh, so you can still use the standard SSH uh, command. The idea here is to have um, a tool that can, can do all the um, additional stuff for you uh, easily. So that means it can deploy, trigger the deployment of uh, your account on the server and get the username uh, that you have on the server and to integrate with your IDC agent to be able to retrieve access tokens and start the session and input the access token and prompt it. So this is all kind of hidden in the client code. And in addition, the clients also, uh, by default, they do IDC agent forwarding. So that allows you to allows this use case of delegation so that you can have the token available on the server and then use it to access other services from there. And um, as I mentioned, you can always use, once you have um, the account deployed and the username is known, you can always just use standard uh, SSH. That's um, possible, it's just a bit more, um, yeah, it's less convenient, let's say, since you it's an interactive uh, process. And since I've been talking so much about how it works, I would also like to uh, show you. So we have here um, a demo server that you can also use yourself if you have, um, actually we support quite a few uh, OPs here. So if you have EGI, WSCG, um, yeah, my, I don't know, deep, there are a few, um, um, yeah, there are a few AIs that we support there, so you can also try it yourself. And um, all right, so actually, um, for the Windows side, uh, right, we have uh, I have a recorded demo since it was a bit more complicated to show this live. But um, what I show here is uh, the full um, setup on Windows. So also installing the IDC agent, setting that up, and logging into this demo server. And um, yeah, once you set up the OIDC agent, the uh, thing to know is that um, you do not need to enter any passwords. Um, 
anymore. So only for each reboot to kind of um, say decrypt your YDC agent configuration. So let's see how this works. Um, I hope you can see this. So you can also find it yourself here at this link. I also have it on, uh, on the last slide. You can install the YDC agent and that also installs the UIDC plugin uh, that does the, um, the authentication. And uh, let's see how you can configure the UIDC agent. So we also create a few shortcuts here for the start menu for some known uh, OPs. I, here I try to configure the EGI, um, EGI OP. Uh, we get the standard um, yeah, consent screen here and you add a password to encrypt uh, your IDC agent config locally and that is already configured. So then you can always get a new token. You also have a shortcut here. You get a new valid token from uh, with your IDC agent. With Pati, you we connect to a server that supports uh, OpenID Connect um, SSH and you simply go to SSH, ask credentials and you add the plugin command to run. Um, and that is uh, our OIDC plugin that was already installed. So the path here is not an option. Without any parameters, you the plugin retrieves all the supported OPs on the server. We select one here, so EGI, since we already configured it. And we see that we are already logged in and an account was, uh, was created for you. And also the groups. Right, and then for subsequent logins, then uh, these choices are cached, so you don't need to select uh, the OP again. It will always log in with the EGI, um, EGI OP. Right, so actually to show you how this works on Linux, uh, we have our MCCLI um, tool. Uh, it's a command line tool, so we can check um, all the options here in the help, but as I mentioned, you simply need to prepend your SSH command with, so without providing a username, uh, let's use again the EGI command, the EGI identity, and let's enable debug output so that we see more information of what happens on the server. And yeah, again, it's quite, uh, um, yeah, there's not a lot to see, but, um, but we are already um, authenticated. So let's look a bit more on what happened here. Um, so we see that the account was um, didn't exist at the login time and then a deployment was triggered and the user was created and it was added to, to the groups. It created a group for um, all my VOs. In this case, I only have a VO here and it added me to another group that's configured there as a primary group. And we see also the um, the username, the user IDs, group IDs, and so on. Um, all right, so uh, with MCCLI, you can always, it's quite nice to get more information from, from the server. You can also uh, try to find out which, with MCLI info, you can find out which OPs are supported on the server or if you provide, again, uh, here uh, an identity, you can find out which users are authorized from, from this uh, OP so that you know, okay, I need to join this VO that if uh, that's specified here. And if you have an account, then you also can find out some information about your local account and also about your um, federated identity. So this is just some nice to have things that you, um, yeah, for uh, MCCLI. So, um, right, another feature I wanted to show was actually uh, the delegation part that I talked about. So, um, for since we saw for EGI, we had a shell that was say a dummy shell where you couldn't actually do anything. I have an account here um, for which um, so I already have a local account created and I actually have a login shell. I have a bash shell. And we see here the account, the OIDC agent account was not loaded. 
uh, I get a prompt to load the account. And I am actually um, logged in, right? And on the server, there are no OpenID Connect, OpenIDC agent um, configurations, but I can still um, uh, access, um, yeah, maybe it's not important to know how this happens, but the, we can access the socket over the uh, over the network on the local uh, host to uh, to get um, yeah the tokens from the IDC agent configured on my local machine. And here we can see easily we can get the token that was used to log in. Even more. Um, if I unload the identity here on the uh, on the local machine and I try to get a token again, I get the prompt that I got earlier to unload. Um, so this is this prompt here is on the local machine. I get the prompt to decrypt um, the IDC agent configuration, and again I get the token directly on um, on the SSH server. Yeah. Right. So um, actually, I have a few more things to show, but I that also depends on how much time there is left. I guess there is some more time. Um, so we saw how the client looks. I wanted to show a bit um, the server. Let's go again on the on the demo server as root, and um, let's look at how the server is configured. So the authorization in particular. Um, right, so what is important here, I would say is you can authorize users in three ways. So you can authorize all users from uh, an OP. You can have a list of yo's that are supported uh, with the configured claim, or you can authorize users uh, individually. And then for each OP, you can change this configuration. And with the default um, config file installed, you have also some examples of how you can use this. And I could show you maybe, so let's take um, another uh, OP here. So this one is commented out. So for now, as I mentioned, all the users are um, authorized. We can try to log in with Deep. I have a YDCH account configure, configured and we can log in Then we see I, I have a local account there. So let's try to disable here um, all users for deep on the server. I hope this works well. <laughs> so we restart the service and then we try again. We don't need all the output there. And as you see, you get uh, an error message. So you're not authorized to, you do not meet any of the authorization requirements uh, on the server and you cannot log in. Even when you try, for example, with, um, so directly with SSH, you can, uh, you can paste your token. That's another thing to show. You can paste your token, but you can see that the authentication um, didn't work with the token. All right. Um, all right, so I guess I have a few more things I could show in the demo, but um, I guess um, time is uh, kind of short, so 
yeah, if you have in the question round, if you have more questions and wish to see anything else, I can show you. But let's go back to the slides. Right, so yeah, we basically, we had quite a list of requirements that we tried to meet with this um, this solution. So we wanted to not patch any of the SSH um, server and client software. We wanted um, this to work without um, uh, a priori provisioning of the user on the server. And we do this with um, monthly queue API and having this client integration that triggers a deployment. Uh, we wanted to mitigate this problem of users sharing their SSH keys, which is quite um, apparently quite common. So we don't use SSH keys at all. We use access token for authentication. And since access tokens um, expire quite fast and they're tied to your federated identity, this is um, um, less of a problem. Uh, we wanted to be able to have non-interactive client logins. Um, that's for yeah for basically scripting things where you use SSH, SCP, and so on. So we by having the UIDC agent integration, you can always get um, yeah a valid token and then um, the SSH without any um, any user interaction. We support the delegation use case as I mentioned with the UIDC agent forwarding. So that's quite. Um, um, quite useful yeah, for things like submitting jobs and then accessing, I don't know, storage that also needs a token and so on uh, from the remote server. Um, the multi-factor authentication uh, that is also possible if we have additional PAM modules. This is not something that we, we implemented, but um, it is possible by the nature of uh, PAM and how they can be combined together. And um, we wanted to be able to revoke um, yeah, credentials easily in case of security incidents. And there are two options to do that. So you can always revoke the tokens themselves, or uh, we provide also the admin endpoint at the REST API that allows you to suspend and resume users um, if you have um, admin rights there. Yeah, so in terms of uh, future work, well, what we still want to do is uh, to support account uh, deprovisioning, so automatically uh, deprovisioning users when they leave their home organization, for example. Uh, we want to do have a more flexible mapping for uh, VOs to groups, so having a more um, flexible kind of naming scheme and only filtering uh, VOs and creating um, specific VOs. We want to integrate with MyToken. This is a tool that we developed also in our group um, that one of the use cases for this tool was to support long running jobs. So this is um, um, kind of thing that um, you cannot do with access tokens since they expire so quickly. We also want to work on uh, integrate, so Kubernetes integration, being able to deploy um, Docker containers on Kubernetes where you can, uh, that you can, um, yeah, use the, our YDC based SSH. And yeah, lastly, we also want to increase kind of adoption and get more people to uh, try it and use it. And so I have here a list of, I don't know if it's comprehensive, but uh, some use cases that of uh, where our tools are being used or evaluated. And so one is um, EGI ACE. It's a um, project that um, tries to integrate, say, HPC resources to um, kind of European cloud infrastructure. Um, and it is used there. We also have an integration with the infrastructure manager is a tool that allows to deploy VMs to various um, public and private clouds. So yeah, public like, uh, yeah, I think supported our Google, Amazon is the main ones. Uh, and um, private, so we have um, for the European open science cloud and yeah, any other I'm not really sure what, what is supported there. Um, right, also we offer, so it's also used by Punch for NFDI for, to provide access to computer resources for particle physics in the Helmholtz cloud. That's a German 
wide infrastructure and there we have a use case with cloud orchestration so where this delegation feature is quite um, useful so uh, different services um, that are kind of working together to submit a compute job upload the um, um, yeah it's, so storage and um, GitLab all kind of working together with access tokens. Right. And uh, yeah, we had another um, point for future work was to actually evaluate the integration with um, SSSD. That's um, typical uh, setup in most, especially in HPC um, uh, infrastructures. Yes, and here is a slide with uh, basically everyone who contributed in one way or another to this work. So either to the development, testing, integration, or um, consulting. And I hope we didn't not forget everyone there. And if you want more information, or if you want to try it yourself, have a look at the links here. And I'd be happy to take questions if there is still time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, fantastic. Uh, and we have two minutes if people want immediate questions answered. Anyone? I, I got a, a quick question about the OIDC agent. It looks like it's a, a pretty important component of it. Well, what range of, of possible uh, user lists can it work with? Can it, can it work? Uh, can it get? Uh, 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 can it talk to, uh, for example, uh, Eden ROM? Can it talk to our Active Directory? Wondered if, if there's been any pressure uh, to do that. I know so, Europe. So. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I understand your question. So the UIDC agent is um, is a user um, tool that allows you to kind of to manage your federated identities and get valid access token for your from your uh, yeah your OpenID Connect provider and. Uh, so, I mean, what is supported, it's, we see here a list of providers that are supported. So I can actually show how this would work in a, um, in a setup. So you can select, um, I'm not sure, let's take uh, number 10. Again, the EGI, you can have, you can configure different scopes that should be supported and then you get redirected to your federated AI. Um, so we have the EGI where you grant access to uh, to the OIDC agent uh, to request those scopes. And then you can always um, get new valid access tokens from, um, from that configured OP without any further interaction. And since these tokens um, expire, so you can always get a new new token. And I guess the question was, so I mean, I, if I understood correctly, the question was about integration with Active Directory on the client side. Correct. Um, hmm. I am not sure. I mean, maybe Gabriel. I think he's also here. He can answer that question. I don't think that. Uh, um, is there? We have some uh, response in the chat, um, and uh, um... yeah, I think I I hope I answered the questions well in uh, in the chat. So, so Mark, it says um, OIDC agent support um, the. Community AI proxies that support it can be used, uh, and unless OIDC federations are generally rolled out, there won't be support for edge again. Um, I think Brian uh, Bachelman, you had your hand up. Do you have a question? Yeah, I, I was wanted to ask um, your thoughts on the OIDC agent-based approach for the client versus uh, the 
so some of the other work I think I've seen from, for example, SDFC and what we use in, in the US, uh, PAM, uh, or using a PAM plugin that does uh, device flow, mm -hmm. which doesn't require any client side pooling. Uh, you know, a, a, did you consider device flow? And, uh, and B, have you run into any problems in terms of user support to getting users to configure and set up OA, OADC agent, which I, I've always worried is a uh, uh, potentially a, a, a large ask. Right. So, well, I mean, I think um, with regards to the comparison, I guess the use case is a little bit different. So, I mean, using device code flow without any additional tool on the client side, that means uh, it's an interactive uh, thing. So you, you always have to go to, yeah, to the website, um, log in. And uh, so it's, you cannot use this, yeah, I don't know, in scripts, right? I mean, it's not an automated process. That was kind of what we, we focus on there on people who need that. So regarding the usability of YDC agent, I mean, well, I think um, HPC users, for example, um, are quite um, familiar with, I don't know, command line and things like that. And we try to, yeah, we try to make it as uh, easy to use as possible. So I guess we, we, we yeah, with the packages and um, all the the tools around it. Of course, there's always a learning curve. So I don't know. I, we we will want to gather more experiences to understand where the users have issues. Um, yeah. If, if well, the possibility to actually not use any tools on the client side is there in some way, but that means there is some manual. There would be some manual setup in advance, so we we can think of. Um, I mean, it's a bit different use case, but yeah, we can think of um, making that easy to do the first step uh, out of band for the user to deploy the account and then use your um, your usual uh, your SSH. Um, yeah, your typical SSH command. So actually. We have, I have a thing here where you can do a, say a dry run. And then you can get the command, the stage command that you can run. Um, so here actually there is a, the token directly, but yeah, you, you can have your user directly and you know so you can manually configure this then by yourself and you don't need the MCCLI itself to to log in. So I understand there is a certain learning curve to that, but I think for some users, this is what they need. <laughs> Great. Well, um, thank you again, Diana. Uh, we'll hold any other questions, write them down and, and we can bring them up again in the discussion later. Um, and uh, in lieu of clapping, uh, we, we appreciate your, your contribution and hope you can uh, see us all waving. Um, and yes. uh, we hope you can stick around for questions later. Um, I'm going to move on to Jens. Jens, are you ready for your presentation? Yeah. Hey. Uh, I just need to find it. Right, can you see the slides? Yeah. Derek, can you see the slides? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. Can you hear us all right? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, um, so yeah, this is the other side of this. This is um, the, the, the other kind of PAM module that Brian just mentioned, where, uh, we have run a trial within Iris. I'll explain shortly what it is, what Iris actually is. Uh, so Jose is somewhere on the call as well. And with Matt from, who was then at the University of Cambridge, he has moved on to different things now, but um, he was one of our co-conspirators in the, in, the, in the trial. So the idea is to use uh, federated identity management within our compute infrastructure. 
So just to explain who we are, like David Crooks just mentioned, we are from UKRI, the UK Research and Innovation. It funds uh, something like eight billion pounds worth of research annually on behalf of the UK government and conducts his own research and uh, has uh, does lots of stuff with um, medicine and, and biosciences and our branch STFC is the one that looks at large scale instruments like um, uh, lasers and, and neutron sources and, and also scientific computing where we are um, contributing here. To interrupt, Jens, just briefly, it's worth noting UK research and innovation covers all the funding councils in the UK. Yeah. Um, so IRIS is essentially the computing infrastructure that supports the STFC funded research. So uh, astronomy and cosmology and also collaborations with uh, with others. So the LHC Large Hadron Collider, the, the June Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, the Vera Rubin Telescope, the Square Kilometer, Kilometer Lurie LIGO. Uh, so it, there's a, a quite a lot of, quite a wide range of, of research supported by IRIS. And DRAG in particular is a subset, if you like, of IRIS that looks at computational cosmology. So very much HPC focused. And as a caveat, there are lots of things out there called DRAG, so do not get confused. So if you look at the IRIS computing, a uh, very, very simplified, is consists of an HTC branch, uh, an HPC branch, and a cloud infrastructure. The HTC branch is essentially grid PP, the UK grid for particle physics, which has X509 as user authentication. Although of course with site tokens and stuff, it it's, tends to move away a bit from user authentication with certificates, but that's not what we're talking about today. There is also the Dirac HPC, which is essentially using SSH keys to log users into their, to the HPC infrastructure, a little bit like uh, what Diana just mentioned. And then there's the Iris Community Cloud that supports the Iris communities, uh, all of them, with a federated authentication and uh, and using passwords as a fallback mechanism, if you like. So the way it's structured um, is with these different branches. These, uh, if you you may have an account on all the different systems, for example, but they would be different accounts. So what we would really like to see is users have a single account that gives them access to all the systems. And there's just a single method for managing that account, managing attributes, managing uh, the, whatever keys need to be managed and, and, and other stuff. So there's just a central service that knows about users and their affiliations and their memberships of groups and, and whatnot and users can request membership of other groups. So in short, what we really want is a federated identity management solution that just gives you access to everything. So today, I will not really talk about the grid PP branch, although I have an opinion about that as well. The Iris Community Cloud is already there. It's already using federated identity management. And uh, the focus today is really on the HPC branch, so give people access via SSH. And then the, the, the final bit, the final piece of the puzzle is really how to manage virtual organizations, so the memberships and the groups and the stuff that, that people want to have as part of their, their normal practice. Like, um, uh, if you're a member of one collaboration, you may want to request membership of another and you want to have maybe assert which one you're a part of or what you what kind of work you want to do. So the whole thing, most of you will have seen this anyway, this is the um, blueprint architecture where you see in the middle a proxy which knows how to talk to everything. So regardless of which identities users have, they will authenticate to the proxy and the proxy then knows how to communicate with the services. The services may again speak different protocols. They might speak SAML or, or OpenID Connect or, or something else, but it doesn't matter because in principle, the proxy is able to, to talk all of these protocols. And in the setup, it would support Edugain. 
So uh, our PPA proxy is in fact connected to EduGain, or both of both the ones that I'm talking about today are connected to to EduGain, because we have one for Iris, and we're setting up a parallel. We have set up a parallel one for the square kilometer array. So some of the work I'm talking about today is actually for Iris, and some of it is for the square kilometer array. Although the the SK stuff is a little bit more um, uh, less mature, shall we say, at this stage. So within Iris, the legacy login, if you like, quote unquote legacy login of Dirac users into their systems is through a system called SAFE. And SAFE is a system for doing somewhat what of, along the lines of what Diana just mentioned for those systems. It manages the accounts, it manages quotas, it manages uh, which sites you're allowed to log into. And then there's a bit of configuration happening at, the, at each of the sites. So for example, a user with an account in Cambridge may not be allowed to log into the, an account in Durham, uh, but they can request access in Durham for their project or their collaboration. And then they would also have an account generated for them, but it needs to be done by an administrator. So uh, in, in the existing setup and how it works today, so somebody would need to say, this user has a requested an account at Durham. They have uploaded their SSH keys. So they'd copy their SSH keys out, create an account for them, and then the user can log in. So it's all very old school, non-federated. It's all very, um, um, I was about to say old fashioned. And intentionally, some of it has to be old fashioned because the administrators at each site want to have a say in who gets to access that site. They want to, to know who their users are. So we can't just have automatic account creation. We have to have some sort of administrative step involved in, in setting up accounts. But we'll cover that later. And I know Diana touched on it in, in her talk as well. On the other side, we have users that are not in safe. So somehow we have to not just have the federated accounts, we also have to have a migration path that brings users from the non-federated account to the federated account. And we have tried to solve that in the short term, at least by having safe authenticate to the BPA proxy, the, the red blob in the middle, the identity and access management blob in the middle. So users can log in in the legacy login using their normal SSH keys using their safe account into the HPC resources in Dirac. But they should also be able to log in using their safe account through the proxy IAM and then onward into Dirac or onward into other Iris services that are not Dirac. So in a sense, we are opening the scope for them that they could do more with their account. And similarly, we also want a branch where the non-safe users, the users who, are, who do not have safe accounts, will eventually be able to log into Dirac HPC resources. So really just to, to try, not just to get the full mesh of collaborations in the Federation, but also to get a, a path where legacy users can continue doing their work without feeling that they have to redo their, or re-request their accounts. So there's an authorization step involved there as well, where users need to um, log in, of course, but then they also need to be authorized. And we do that with group memberships. And we shall see later in the talk how that's done. And this is actually one of the questions. Uh, there is an LDAP call out that will check whether you are a member of a local LDAP server. But this is a, a site-specific LDAP server. There is no universal LDAP setup that knows about your accounts at all sites. So a site might set up an LDAP query that says, is this, this user allowed to log in? Another site in Dirac will say, well, actually, we don't use LDAP for that. And they will just configure the group memberships manually. So there are sort of two steps involved in getting the PAM login working with this. One is to get the user account set up so they can, they can log in. You would then not need the SSH keys, 
but you will also need to set up the authorization by saying this group has now got access to this infrastructure. So that group information comes from the IAM server now, not from the not from SAFE. And it will still be it, it is an additional check that is done when the user logs in. So how does it work? Um, the original code that we built on is from our friends, friends in the Czech Republic from the Masarykova University. They started building it and we forked it to add some different authorization branches to the code. And we also did some refactoring and, and hardening and stuff um, over a, a few months last year. And uh, in order that we could deploy it in production for Iris and, and uh, some of the advantages are that not only do you not need SSH keys, you do not need anything else. You don't, it's a perfectly standard SSH client. It's a perfectly standard SSH server. There's nothing changed. There's, there's nothing else needed other than the OIDC infrastructure. So there's, there's no special magic needed. There's no um, equivalent of Motley Crew. So account management is done elsewhere in SAFE, for example or at the sites and uh, user memberships and, and whatnot is done in the IAM service in the, in the proxy in the middle. There are some disadvantages though, compared to what Diana just showed us. But uh, before we get to that, uh, one of the requirements that sites let us know about was they wanted to try and run a single PAM stack. And to do that, you need to have some users come in if they're external users they have to come in through the federated identity management because that's the whole purpose of the exercise but if they're not external users you want them to come in through the same pam stack but not be asked to authenticate through the iam service so to support that use case we built in a bypass feature which says that for certain users that are listed in a configuration file, or they are looked up in an LDAP server locally, we can bypass the module, the federated lookup, and then fall back to something else like passwords or something. So in the PAM configuration, it will say that the, the OAuth device looking, the device flow that we're using here is a, a sufficient login if, if you have an account there if you do not bypass the module. If you bypass the module, it drops through the stack and goes through to the password authentication on the next step. This means that you only ever get asked for the password authentication if the PAM module bypasses you. If the PAM module authentication, the federated login is successful, you do not drop through to the passwords, you just get logged in. So we, we see that also internally where uh, Jose, for example, will want to have a separate login for root. So using the same kind of thing, you can you can sort of set up a special login path for root if you want to have root SSH logins. Um, because obviously you, you this is kind of one of those things you don't want to do with a federated identity management system. So the way it works, uh, this is the LDAP example, but bypass actually works for the whole module for all the authentication paths through the module and authorization paths. So if there's no LDAP configured at all, it will just go straight through to some other authentication mechanism like, um, uh, like group memberships or, or something. So you still do the federated authentication in any case, but the authorization step is then based on your group memberships or your um, or something else. If LDAP is configured, you can configure LDAP to optionally do, optionally do the bypass. So if a user lookup in the LDAP database is, is successful or not successful, you will bypass the module and fall through to the next thing in the PAM stack. Or you can do an LDAP query based on the local username or on the remote username. The remote username is the name that the PAM module gets from the user info. And the local username is the one that you use when you log in. 
So when you say SSH so-and-so user at system, then you use the local username. The remote username will be the one from, from the user info so that the whichever username is configured in the in the proxy. And those two also have to match in a in a lookup table as well. So there's an extra check done on that that authentication login. So this is actually very useful because this, this now means that you can set up, there's a considerable amount of flexibility in setting up this system and getting it working. So as I mentioned, this was a fork from our friends in the Czech Republic. And just to compare those, um, we, we chose to stay with them with how they had set up things. They were using C++11, so we chose to stay with C++11 rather than going to a later one. Um, the configuration file is written in JSON, which um, is perhaps not the ideal language for, for writing configuration files, but we chose to stay with that, to see that that choice as well. And the same thing building with make rather than, say, CMake or something. But the whole idea of refactoring is that modern C++ has lots of features to, that help ensure correctness of the code. So we want to use modern C++ features as much as possible because it, it makes the code cleaner, it makes it easier to read, and it makes it easier to see that the code is correct, that it's doing the right thing. So the main changes that we have done since the fork is to improve the certificate checking, that the certificate checks that the, the proxy's certificate is correct, that it's valid, um, that it hasn't expired, and, and all that sort of stuff that it supports NSS-based curl clients as well, because it depends on the curl library for, for doing the callouts. There's a debug mode for the certificates. There's a debug mode for HTTP that Brian has contributed. There is um, improved logging, and the configuration file can be split into sections, which essentially looks like this. So you can see I have a an overall configuration file. And I have a configuration file with the OAuth stuff split out, with different OAuth configurations. And then I have another one with the secrets in them that is also split out. So, and I have one with the user mappings split out as well. So um, it makes it kind of more manageable because um, as I suggested that we could that it would be a useful feature. And it turned out actually, so you can manage your configuration files in, in snippets. Anywhere there's a curly bracket in the JSON, you can split that out into a separate file. Each file is still valid JSON. So you can, you can syntax check them and whatever you like to them, but they will still allow branches and, and sort of snippets of file speed to be kept in different locations. Looking at upstream, um, I hope I'm doing justice to our Czech friends. They have set up um, configurations of using multiple LDAP servers. They have also improved the syslog stuff, which is uh, probably similar to what we've done. They have refets MFA support. So this means that if the multi-factor authentication attributes are communicated from the proxy, then the module can make use of that for authorizations. So this is different from the MFA that Diana talked about, where, like us, we have to do it in the PAM stack of having multiple authentication steps. Here, the, the proxy will do the, um, the open ID provider will do the multi-factor authentication and communicate an assertion that says, I have done multi-factor authentication for this user. So uh, one of the other things I mentioned was I'm with one of my other hats, I'm doing stuff with a square kilometer array and they're also looking at testing this. Uh, so one of the things they, they, they did when they looked at this said, um, what happens if I log in and I log in again? Do I have to go through the whole workflow again? And yes, this is indeed one of the disadvantages of this flow because um, compared to what Diana just talked about, you still have to go through the, the SSH client is completely unmodified. It has no state or anything. It does not know that you have already logged in again. So 
if you type in a separate terminal, SSH login, blah, 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 then you have to go through the whole flow again. Now, that may be nice to a nice thing to change, but it was actually, um, as a consequence, on Windows, for example, you don't have to do any changes. There's nothing. It is the perfectly standard putty or, or whatever SSH agent you have on Windows. There's nothing changed there. So um, so it, it is kind of like advantages and disadvantages. We're also not doing the delegation that Diana talked about, which would be a useful thing, but we'll probably need a bit of thought. And the final thing they needed, they, they find was that the high, avail high availability setup is needed for the proxy. This is not so much a PAM module issue. It's it's really just um, uh, an issue with the, um, just to make sure that if you need the PAM module to call out to the, to the IAM service, then the IAM service should be highly available. So other things we want to do, um, we, it would be nice to start sharing code perhaps with people, or I suppose you can also take the alternative view that it's nice to have different solutions. As Deanna mentioned, we have slightly different use cases. So having different solutions that you can build on is, is actually perhaps a useful thing to do. So I think it's good that we get together to compare notes and things and see where we are. Uh, for example, it may be useful to have the, the MFA support once the Indigo IM that we are using as a proxy has support for it. There are some other things that I'll, I'll get to in, in, in a moment, and um, that would be nice to do. Authorization, for example. So one of the reasons we forked the original code was that we wanted to do extra layers of authorization for our cloud service. And that's great. But if we need to add a new community, we want, don't want to add another authorization branch. So the question is whether the authorization steps that we do within the module are sufficient for all the user communities that we've got, or we need something more sophisticated. It checks that you can log in, of course, because you have to do the federated login. Then it checks your in user info, whether your, your remote username has the correct relationship to the local username that you asked for, and it checks your group memberships or whatever authorization steps you have configured or an LDAP lookup or something. Does that cover enough of the processes or do we actually need a call out so, so to make it really flexible? Other things to note is that the, the group membership information that we get is not GO69 compliant. If you're not familiar with GO69, it's essentially saying that there should be a standard way of communicating group memberships as an attribute. So that what we actually get is taking an SKA example. Uh, if I'm a member of the SKA, SKA organization and I'm a member of the UK SK regional center, and I'm a member of the purple team within that, it will be communicated as, as three different group memberships, even if I'm just a member of one group and two subgroups of that. With um, GO69, that is communicated as a single entitlement that here I have used a hypothetical OGF namespace that says I'm a member of a group, UKSRC Purple, within the SKA organizational namespace. So it is a slight, slightly different way of managing group memberships that we should also be able to cope with. So that seems like something we need to add at some point. The other thing to look at is account management, because as Diana alluded to, there is no this, this solution that I'm talking about here has no way of doing account management other than if you want to synchronize accounts directly with an API in the IAM server in the middle in the proxy. And to some extent, we have to do that because as I mentioned, the HPC systems administrators at each site want to have some level of control over which users are allowed to log into their sites. So as a corollary, the account deprovisioning also becomes interesting for us because they need to be notified if the account is created by the IAM service that the user has ceased to have the affiliation that was used as a basis for setting up their account. But in practice, 
it may be less confusing for the users if they had the same username across, across all the sites, which could be the preferred username attribute that we asked them to set when they create an account in the proxy. Or it could be a local lookup as well. If, if you remember Moonshot, um, it had, when you, used, when you authenticated using Moonshot, you just said SSH at remote. There was no username because it will do the radius um, lookup and using the, your home organization attribute provider, you would get the username that you were supposed to have on the remote site. Or we could use some other mapping tools, like um, if you remember GUMS or LC maps, if you've been around in the community for a while, you may remember those that map a, a separate tool to do the account mapping of user accounts into into um, whatever local account you've got. If you look at what is set up here, the account mapping is still calling out to the module, but currently the module essentially does nothing for the account mapping. So again, this is something that we might want to fix. The next step, uh, so I mentioned this is a trial across the DRAC HPC infrastructure, and the next step obviously would be to roll it out into production. So the sites that have test that have participated in the test could obviously now roll it out into some sort of production setup. Again, it is important to have this migration path that I mentioned earlier because the existing users will need to be trained to use the new solution and um, and new users then, of course, will need to be set up using the new path. So there probably is, is a bit of effort required on the user support side as well. So we'll need to, to probably run the new solution and the old solution in parallel for a little while. Also, it would be nice to have support for GO69 attributes because that hopefully should be coming at some point in Indigo IAM that we're using as the proxy solution. The MFA is also an obvious thing. We have some projects that are interested in using MFA, so uh, it may be useful to have support for that. And also the delegation stuff would be interesting to investigate. There's actually a fair bit of stuff that we need to do, and, and we're probably expecting a bit of feedback from SK as well when they start testing it in earnest, um, which should actually be should be interesting. So with that, I will just show you quickly. I was going to give you a demo, but a networking issue means that the PAM modules are not able to talk to the backend databases at the moment for some strange reason that they, that, um, if I can type, yeah. So there's a networking issue on the database backend. So what I will show you instead is one that I had made earlier. Uh, this is essentially what it looks like with an, a login that there's a call out to the IAM service in this in, and you can see the token that comes back from the service, the token stuff. Um, this is not exactly the most readable format, but you can see there is there should be a refresh token in here somewhere. There's a token type, refresh token. Uh, you can see it's a bearer token. And uh, you can see um, lots of other stuff in there. Now, the interesting bit is when the user info comes back after my successful authentication. You can see there's a sub with a um, anonymized identifier that comes out of, this is my primary key in the, in the IAM database. My name comes back, my preferred username, which somehow happens to be my email address in this setup. A given name, family name, updated, email, email verified, and my group memberships. So you can see my I have a couple of group memberships here and my organization name, which is somehow set to Iris I am. So this is what it looks like in on the server side in debug mode, where you can sort of see all of the steps. Also note that I've called it PAM SSHD. 
because um, I have used a uh, separate binary, although it is actually exactly the same. Uh, it is exactly the same as the normal SSHD system on, in the, on the system. It is just so I can have a separate separate uh, PAM configuration file for it without messing with the system's configuration file. So with that, if I can find my slides again, I will wrap up. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Nand. Uh, appreciate that. Um, we have a few minutes before our break. Uh, if anybody has any burning questions. Uh, also, I noticed that there were various comments made in the chat here. Yeah, um, Brian very helpfully put some comments in. You can see. Uh, well, yeah, I, I can summarize them if, if you'd like. Um, so, so we have a, a real similar setup on one of our uh, login services uh, for OSG. Uh, two things we've learned. Uh, one is all the bypass, uh, you know, in terms of uh, bypassing for UID range or a uh, combination of group and IP addresses. If, if this this can all be done through existing PAM language. Uh, it makes the the PAM configs uh, <laughs> a a mental puzzle to to read through sometimes. But it it also means that uh, you you don't have to have that functionality. Uh, and so all all the LDAP integration, all that stuff can can be ejected out to existing PAM modules, which we've uh, benefited from. Uh, the other thing is uh, precisely for the SKA issue uh, you, you brought up in terms of, gee, it's annoying to do this more than once a day. Uh, we ran into similar issues in that we require two-factor auth, uh, and, and there was lots of grumbling amongst the staff about having to uh, play with uh, duo and press key fobs more than once a day. So when people get to that point in their life, we share with them some SSH snippets to persist control connections, which effectively mean, um, you know, unless you turn off your laptop, unplug it, then move to a coffee shop, uh, uh, you, you're not going to have to recreate the TCP connections for, for SSH. So that's that's made the, uh, the, the the hordes with uh, pitchforks uh, largely go away on on that particular aspect. So it's it, again, it's it's not something we solved within the PAM setup, but it's it's SSH configs. But uh, most people seem to put up with it. It's very interesting. Thank you, Brian. Do we have any other questions either online or from the group here? I've noticed in, um, for both of the these first presentations, it seems like there's more of an emphasis on um, maintaining some kind of session. Um, and I haven't seen examples necessarily of where um, there's use of a, of a token that doesn't have a good notion of a session which I know it, it brings up the issue of revocability, but with uh, you know short time to live, is that is that a concern? Do we have to you have to have something in session based for author, uh, authorized energy? Yeah, that's probably a trade-off between the time to live for the whatever session you have locally, if you have one, and the ability to revoke tokens or revoking logins. And so um, and that probably just answers half your question, but uh, um, for some of our user communities, we also need to time them out if they have been idle for too long. So, so um, because once the session is open, then, and, and if it's idle, then we have to, to kill the connection. Because otherwise, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, um, if if their token times out, but they're still authenticated, then they can just keep it open forever, essentially. 
Mm -hmm. I, I noticed that you had a, a line that you mentioned about caching sessions. And is that to deal with the issue that you probably have like a, a well, if not a single point of failure, uh, a concentration uh, required session management that all, you know, the best clients that are trying to connect all have to go through. Is that the issue? Uh, well, it sounds like Brian has a better solution for that, if I understood it correctly. You mean in the terms of persisting the SSH or, or saving the SSH session? Yeah, because I don't mind doing it once a day, like sort of logging, logging in and hmm. and stuff. And if it's then persistent across for the day. Yeah, I have to admit that I find Linux tools for revoking users especially in terms of people have SSH logins, <laughs> absolutely lousy. Um, I, I can't tell you how many scripts I've seen floating around that kill off long living TMUX sessions and things like this to, to get uh, users who embed deeply into a, a login host off. <laughs> um, yeah. and each site tends to solve this separately. And uh, again, I, I just find the existing OS tools pretty pretty lousy for revoking access. Kind of once you're in the door, you're you can squirrel away quite the, quite well. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that's always been true. I mean, if you think of, for example, Grid FTP uh, or the, the the Globus Grid FTP implementation, forked the process that lived for as long as the TCP connection existed. Um, which again, we we never used it like that, but. I, People can make TCP connections live long times. It's uh, always an important thing and always uh, underappreciated, you know, kicking people out once they get through the door. Yeah, it goes back to the the um, deprovisioning stuff that Marcus and Diana are working on. And in practical terms, I just when I log into an S one of my SSH systems, I just leave the SSH session open and I go to lunch and stuff or whatever, and I come back and it's still open. I don't need to log in again. So that doesn't matter. But if we're going to close the account for users who are idle, then you probably want to cache it locally on the system for at least till the next morning. So there, there are some, as ever, usability versus security trade-offs to, to be had. And maybe a case for documenting like a, a SSH for HPC, how to, the different ways we can solve these problems. Yeah, there's always that session uh, or, or a problem that you run into is what if I have to turn somebody off quickly and they have open sessions and how do I clean those up and how do I hunt them down and kill them? Um, those that will always plague us, uh, but you know, in building all this stuff so that it's easy for the user, we need to be careful that we don't uh, shoot ourselves in the foot and being able to knock off people when we have to. Um, or at least have a way of uh, communicating that things need to be shut down uh, to the various places where they can be done. Um, because we don't all live in a shared administrative environment, so invariably you're crossing environments and you need to be able to communicate that. Um, that's yeah. not going to go away. Um, yes, because because if you ahead, if you kill someone at your site, like Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, then you've just done it at your site. They may have logins at other sites as well in a federated infrastructure. So if they're actually abusing their privileges and, and doing something they shouldn't on the system, you probably kill their account and, and kick them out, which you can do. But then what about the other sites that, that where the user runs jobs? Put out the ATD or something. Well, that's sort of what we yeah. have to think about in, in access, you know, when yeah. we have all these other sites. Um, I just wanted to mention there is at least a something called certify that's meant to address that that's intimate mm -hmm. response to the federated environment yeah it doesn't yeah. It, there's no there's no technology there's nothing automatic or magical about it but it means that everyone that kind of signed on to certify is ready and willing to respond reasonably quickly to notifications of that sort right. and so, so that's it's something it's not nothing we all have to have this in our playbook right yeah so how do i do it locally right uh, so, that's great uh we're into our uh 
into our break and I don't want the coffee to get cold. Uh, thank you, Jens, uh, <laughs> again for uh, your presentation. I hope you stick around. We're going to take a break for about 24 minutes until 11 a.m. local time. And then we'll pick up uh, with our next presentation, um, which will be the uh, hopefully Lee Liming uh, talking to us about global integration with NIH's researchers uh, authentication service. So uh, take a break and we'll see you in 20 plus minutes. Thank you. Are the rooms safe until we take our last time to do uh, Somebody will be here. Thank you. Yeah. Our last will be here. We promise to get top dollar for anything. Welcome back. Uh, we're um, going to continue now with uh, new liming from uh, Argonne and University of Chicago. Uh, he's going to talk to us about global integration with NIH research authentication service and the NIH Common Fund Data Ecosystem. Uh, Lee, are you good and ready to go? You look like you're still on mute. I think so. Um, you can see my slide still, right? Yeah, and we can hear you well as well. Thank you. Great. Go ahead. All right. Um, this is going to be a bit of a different style talk than um, the previous two. Um, I think the best way to sum it up is to say that um, this is an interesting story about um, trying to enable what on the surface looks like a very simple or even trivial um, uh, user experience that ended up requiring quite an awful lot of um, uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> by a lot of people in order to make it happen. Um, but the um, one of the nice outcomes of it is that we can see from it a number of future directions that I think will be very important moving forward. Um, so be prepared to be underwhelmed by the user story or the use, use case that we are enabling. Um, and perhaps be a little surprised by how much um, needed to go into making it work, but then also hopefully being a little bit surprised about um, what that allows us to do moving forward. The other thing I wanted to say right off the bat is that I have a cold today. Um, and so there's a possibility while I'm talking that I'll have to cough or sneeze. And I'll do my best to make sure that if that happens, I move far, far, far away from the microphone. But in case I goof, uh, apologies in advance. And let me get my cursor in the right place. All right. So the context for this uh, capability is something called the National Institutes of Health's Common Fund Data Ecosystem, or CFDE. CFDE is a program of the National the, the United States National Institutes of Health. And the idea is to simplify and standardize and hopefully improve researchers' experiences using data produced by the NIH Common Fund. Uh, very similar to um, other organizations like the NASA Earth Observing of Satellite Portal, uh, which provides uh, a single uh, portal for accessing Earth observational data, uh, or the United States Geological Surveys, USGS's science space for geological data, or even a system like Access for National Science Foundation supercomputing centers. The idea is to allow all uh, systems that are provided by a number of different providers to integrate with each other in such a way that researchers have a smoother experience using data from all of the different providers. The Common Fund 
in the National Institutes of Health sponsors a number of about several dozen uh, big programs, each of which uh, is an umbrella that has dozens of individual research projects under them, all of which are producing what we consider to be very high value biomedical data. Um, so for uh, some of the I, uh, um, some of the logos over on the right side of my screen um, are these programs. Uh, so think of think of it in terms of uh, a, a, a massive program nationwide that collects genomic data uh, and tissue samples from children with cancer, uh, or um, a massive national scale program that collects uh, genomic samples of all of the uh, microorganisms that make up the human microbiome, or in other words, all of the microorganisms that live inside our bodies um, all the time that are not, that don't actually share our DNA. Um, or another massive program that is working to build a uh, biomolecular atlas of the human body at the cellular scale. So big projects producing high value medical data, but all of them doing it independently of each other and in their own way. So every one of these programs has something called a data coordinating center or DCC that collects and manages the data from all of the research projects under the program. And each DCC currently has its own data portal. Some of them even have more than one. And so from the researcher's point of view, it's very challenging to navigate all of them. Uh, if you need to find, if you need to integrate data from more than one program in order to do your research project. So one of the first outcomes uh, in phase one of the CFDE program was to contract out to um, a group of, of organizations led by the University of Maryland School of Medicine with uh, help from the universities and schools um, listed at the bottom of the screen to develop a master catalog of all of the data that's available across all of these programs in the NIH Common Fund, and a data portal that allows researchers to discover data from all of the programs. The screenshot that you see is uh, available at the address uh, at the top of the screen. Uh, it's publicly available, and anyone can use it to find data uh, that's provided by one of the common fund programs that might be relevant to a whole host of research problems. So the user experience that I want to talk about today, uh, that again, I said seems really simple at, uh, on the surface, is in addition to allowing researchers to discover data that might be available or that is available from the common fund programs, also inform them about their current data access authorizations during that discovery process. So not only can you find out what data is available, you can also find out whether you have permission already to access it or whether it's restricted in some way and you have to apply for access in order to get it. So what does that look like in practice? And here I am uh, going into the time machine a little bit um, because this is something that's already available in the CFDE portal today. And all I had to do is take a screenshot, which was wonderful. Uh, a couple of years ago when we were scoping this out, we were really unclear about how this was going to look, but um, now we, we know. Um, what we've done is when you, this is a, a an example search in the CFDE portal. Uh, I asked for data that is related to nervous system diseases and that uh, is also associated with the adrenal gland. And so I got a list of files that are available. It turns out in this case from the Gabriella Miller Kids First Pediatric Research Program and uh, actually from a, a study within that program called the Neuroblastoma Project. And what you see in this third or fourth column here is a list of study IDs and a yellow, a yellow dot. The yellow dot means that this file requires authorization and I, as the person who's logged into the portal right now, uh, do not have access to it. And the study ID that's listed there is the study that I need to apply for in order to get access to the data. So it's a really, on the surface, very simple thing that we want to enable. 
but it's really complicated when it when you get down to the nails and tacks of how the information is available and uh, where it's coming from. So let me step back a minute and talk a little bit about um, human subject data. For obvious reasons, privacy for human subject data is a really touchy, sensitive, I should say, <laughs> um, and very important uh, 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 issue. In particular, if I am providing access to data and someone improperly accesses it, someone who wasn't supposed to, I can be hit with very, very severe penalties, not just me, but the organization that uh, employs me. Uh, these penalties are severe enough that they are a significant risk for institutions at the university scale and also at the federal uh, entity scale like the National Institutes of Health. So this is a, what we would consider to be a high risk activity. Uh, you do not want it to be possible for anyone to gain access improperly uh, to any of this data. Also, the specific policies for accessing any particular data set can be complex, and there are a lot of them. Uh, and the reason for that is because there are a lot of people who are involved in the policy side of this system. Um, there are a lot of opinions about how data should be available, and there are a lot of contracts uh, and negotiations that go into how data will be available when a research pro project is conducted. Uh, and so far, there has not been a huge degree of standardization uh, around the policies that will be used. And so there's actually um, a fairly complex system of policies. And again, the, uh, the, 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 the penalties for getting it wrong are very stiff. One of the ways that data, is, uh, that data access for human subject data is authorized is by something called a data access committee. This is where a group of people, usually researchers, biomedical researchers, are charged with reviewing applications from researchers to gain access to a particular data set. And they compare the request against a defined data access policy. So they're actually looking at whether the researcher a is a bona fide researcher and actually has the credentials to do what they say they're going to do, and B, whether the data that they're ask, asking for is necessary in order to do the research that they say that they're going to do. And finally, does it fit within the policy that was established when the data was collected for what it could be used for? What you need to know from a implementation perspective is that there are many data access committees, and there are also many data access systems that have to implement the decisions made by the data access committees. So it isn't the case that there is one data access system for all NIH data. There's actually many different systems that are used to access NIH data. And, um, and there are many committees that are making decisions about who can access the data. These things aren't tightly integrated. They're kind of loosely integrated. Uh, and th the, the applications such as the CFDE portal also may not be closely affiliated with either the data access committees or with the data access systems. In the, this particular case, the CFDE portal really has no formal relationship at all with any of the data access systems that you would use to access the data itself once you find out from the CFDE portal that it exists. So all that adds up to a fairly simple statement, which is that access to authorization data is a capability that's critical to making this work. We need to be able to have a common way to access the authorization data generated by all of these different data access committees so that it can be implemented by the data access systems and so that it can be explained to people in portals like the CFDE portal. So luckily for us, there was already an organization out there called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or GA4GH, which had been working on this problem, developing a standard mechanism for communicating this information um, in a secure manner. GA4GH defined uh, two specifications, one called AAI and one called Passport. 
um, that are turned out to be very useful for our system. Um, the AAI uh, specification defines what are called GA4, GH claims and something called visas. Visas are just like the visas in your passport, in your, you know, the passport that you use when you travel, are authorization assertions that are signed by an issuer that can be communicated throughout the system. The important thing here is that they are signed cryptographically um, and that that signature from the issuer remains with the visa as the visa goes through the system. The visa also contains a signed uh, JWT or, uh, um, that can be used with an OAuth that can be used as an OAuth access token with data access systems. So your visa not only uh, says in claims that you have permission to something, but it also gives you an OAuth access token that you can use with a data access system to actually access the data. The passport specification is complementary to this. It defines a JSON data structure that contains visas for a particular person. So for example, uh, I could go to a GA4GH passport uh, uh, thing and say, give me my passport uh, for Lee Liming, and it'll pull together all the visas that it knows about that uh, are for me, and it will build, uh, construct them into this JSON data structure called a passport. The visas in the passport can inform applications like the CFDE portal about um, a person's authorizations. And it can also use the embedded OAuth access tokens in the visas to access data on the individual's behalf. So a passport is a very handy thing to get for a person. A few more details that I wanna cover before um, I explain what we did in order to make this work in the CFDE portal. Um, the GA4, GH, AAI specification also defines something called an OIDC broker service. The OIDC broker service pulls together or actually obtains visas from issuers. And one important point that needs to be clear here is that the specification doesn't say how it does that. It just asserts that the OIDC broker needs to have a way to get visas from issuers. Um, as far as I know, there is no specification for mechanisms for doing that. It's an informal process, um, but these are signed things. Uh, and so there is assurance at least that when it ends up um, at the OIDC broker, it has a way of verifying that it actually was issued by the entity that uh, signed it. The um, OIDC broker service is responsible for authenticating researcher identities. So it is an OIDC or OpenID Connect 1.0 service. Uh, and it also generates and delivers passports for authenticated individuals to applications. It leverages the OpenID Connect 1.0 specification very heavily. So uh, an OIDC broker is an OpenID Connect 1.0 uh, endpoint. It has uh, all the um, authorized and user info and token introspection uh, 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 endpoints, API endpoints. It um, is required by the specification to support both the auth code flow for confidential clients and the implicit flow for um, with the ID token response type for um, uh, for uh, like JavaScript front end um, browser uh, browser apps, and um, during the OIDC flow, the application needs to uh, request a well known OAuth scope in order to get the passport for the individual. Uh, the the scope is GA four GH underscore passport underscore V one. If that scope is present during the authorization flow, then the passport will appear as a claim. In the, in the user info response from the OIDC server um, and can be used by the application. So one key, I'm gonna stop here for a second and just point out one key implication. Because most OpenID Connect servers will only accept access tokens that they themselves issue, in order to obtain the researcher's passport, the researcher must authenticate with the OIDC broker. You can't authenticate with another service and then come to the OIDC broker and ask for an individual's passport. 
this is something that we are working um, that, you know, we're exploring, you know, would it be possible for uh, an OIDC broker to accept tokens from uh, issued from other uh, auth services? Uh, but that's currently the, the situation with the uh, uh, OIDC brokers that I'm aware of. All right. So what did we do? Um, well, the first thing to, that, um, is that there's something that we didn't have to do because it was already being done by NIH. Um, and I hope that you'll, you'll realize here that much of the heavy lifting in this solution was already done for us by the National Institutes of Health um, by providing a service called the Researcher Auth Service, or RAS. Um, NIH's RAS is a GA4GH OIDC broker. It, um, it obtains visas from the Database of Genotypes and Phenotypes, or dbGaP. dbGaP is a system that's been used for more than a decade now to control access to, uh, uh, to human subject data uh, produced by various programs in the NIH. The, the visas originate from the dbGaP data access committees. So there are a whole host of data access committees that are in place, uh, supervised by the dbGaP uh, enterprise or system or whatever you want to call it. Um, and dbGaP issues visas based on the decisions uh, produced by the data access committees. So I'm stating this as a goal today because it isn't completed, but the, the goal is that eventually RAS will be the service that authorizes access to NIH controlled access data. In order to make that happen, NIH is, is uh, aiming to and working uh, pretty hard, I think, to integrate its many data access systems with RAS so that they use RAS for the authorization uh, to data in, in their systems. NIH has also worked to integrate RAS itself with other authorization systems besides dbGaP. dbGaP isn't the only authorization system that is uh, used that governs access to NIH's data. There are others. Um, it, a, a large portion of the data is public use and doesn't require much authorization. Um, and there are others that use uh, other ad hoc processes uh, to decide who's allowed to access the, the data. And the idea is that we will integrate all of, as many as possible of those with RAS so that it can uh, communicate uh, the authorization information to clients uh, and as many data access systems as possible will use RAS for their authorization. Another thing that I wanted to point out is that RAS's OIDC service enables multiple authentication mechanisms, uh, methods. Right now with NIH with uh, RAS, you can authenticate to, RA to the RAS's OIDC service using NIH's internal, what's called the ERA Commons uh, ident uh, identity uh, service. Uh, that's an identity provider that NIH operates itself. Um, you can also use an NIH smart card or authenticator app. Uh, if you don't, if you're uh, an internal N uh, NIH employee uh, and you don't use ERA Commons, you can use the login.gov service provided by the federal government. Um, they are right now in the process of adding uh, uh, the ability to authenticate using in common IDPs, um, that is, university and campus uh, identity providers, and um, also social auth providers. The, both of those have stars on them because. Uh, NIH is imposing some requirements on uh, the authentication assurance that needs to be done in order to be used with RAS. So that means that not every in common IDP is allowed at the moment, and not every social auth provider is allowed at the moment, only certain ones that um, can provide the authentication assurance, in particular multi factor authentication that NIH uh, requires for use with RAS. RAS does provide identity linking and individual client applications like the CFDE portal can be configured to enable a distinct set of login methods. So you can say, which of these uh, login methods do you want to be supported when you authenticate with RAS from a particular application? All right, so what did we do to make this work with Globus um, and with the CFDE portal? Well, first of all, let me, um, 
explain that the CFDE portal was already using Globus APIs and services. Um, and so that's why Globus got pulled into this mix. Um, the CFDE portal used auth for um, Globus's auth API for logging into the portal itself. Um, it also used the Globus Groups API for permissions within the portal. Uh, as you can understand, um, in order to build this master catalog across all of these different data coordinating centers, we needed to provide the data coordinating centers with the ability to submit their data holdings uh, into, the, into the portal and review it and curate it, et cetera. And that's all authorized using groups uh, in the Globus Groups API. And then finally, we, it also used the transfer and flows APIs for the data submission process to make it simpler um, for both the data, uh, the data um, coordinating centers and also for the operators of the portal. So all of these APIs require Globus issued access tokens. So we have already in the CFDE portal a requirement to get Globus issued access tokens, but in order to get the researcher's passport, we need a RAS issued access token. So the simplest way to implement that would be to require researchers to authenticate twice, once with Globus in order to use all the portal's features, and once with RAS to access the passport. But we rejected that because we felt that it was a bad user experience. Uh, we didn't want people to have to authenticate twice. So instead, uh, we recognize that Globus already supports the use of other OIDC auth services and asked ourselves, could we add uh, RAS as an OIDC auth provider in Globus and pass the researcher's passport information through Globus to the client application, the CFDE portal? That's exactly what we did. So here in a nutshell is what we did. We added RAS as a Globus authentication provider so that you can, when you authenticate uh, in the portal with Globus, you can select NIH researcher auth service as your login provider. Uh, and we used RAS's GA4GH OIDC service endpoint as the, uh, as the, ident as the uh, yeah, identity provider. Um, and we configured it to allow the, uh, to use the ERA Commons and NIH Smart Card um, or Authenticator uh, login options. We added a new scope in Globus called RAS Passport. This is not the standard GA4GH um, uh, scope because we're not providing the, the, the interface that GA4GH specified, um, but there is this scope. Um, only whitelisted clients are allowed to use this scope um, the RAS, and that's because the RAS team, the NIH RAS team has to approve all clients of um, the researcher auth service. And so we needed to use the whitelisting mechanism to make that um, authorization possible. When that scope is requested and when you use, when you authenticate with RAS, um, we add the, the standard GA4GH Passport V1 scope to the login flow with RAS so that when uh, the authentication is successful, Globus can then call RAS's user info endpoint, grab the passport out of the claims that are provided by, from user info from RAS. Very critically, we remove all the cryptographic signatures from the visas so that they are no longer operable. You can no longer use them for data access. And we store the remaining claims that basically tell you what this person is authorized to, 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 to do. Um, in the session cache for that session in Globus. Then when uh, we also modified Globus's um, token introspection response so that when an application calls token introspection on the token that it gets from Globus, um, the, um, the claims that were returned from RAS, the, the passport claims that are no longer signed, um, are provided as part of the token introspection response. So at this point, the application is able to see the permissions that the person uh, has been granted through RAS. But 
very critically, uh, it's impossible to use anything from this information in order to actually perform data access. The reason for that is because the CFDE portal doesn't actually provide data access. It only provides discovery services. Uh, in order, once you've found out that data exists, you still need to go to the, uh, the, the, the data coordinating center portal uh, that actually provides access to the data in order to access it. And so we wanted to minimize our risk. Um, since there was no possibility that the portal would need to provide data access, we just we basically didn't want Globus to have those uh, access tokens anywhere in its system uh, where they might be potentially compromised. And so we did we, what we call diffused the, the, the passport so that it's not actionable. This is what it looks like in practice. This is the token introspection response. Um, the OpenID Connect 1.0 token introspection. Um, you'll notice that um, up here at the top are all the usual uh, OIDC token introspection claims, um, the username, the scopes um, that are associated with that particular token, uh, expiration time, issue time, the subject, et cetera. But an additional one, uh, this stuff was already in Globus. Uh, Globus already had uh, in the token introspection response a section about the authentication session um, and all the authentications that have happened within that session. Um, who did the, did the individual authenticate with? What time was the authentication? Um, were there any um, MFA claims that were um, present in that authentication, et cetera? And then we added custom claims and a CFDE GA4GH Passport V1 uh, section that basically has all the information that came back from RAS. Critically in there, there are two pieces of information that are really important. One is an expiration time, and the other is the dbGaP permissions. So um, the expiration time tells us um, how long is this passport valid, um, because there, there is essentially no way to revoke access. Um, it, it needs to be um, set to a sh fairly short lifetime. In practice, uh, we found that RAS passports uh, have a 12-hour expiration time. And so you basically have a 12-hour window after you obtain a passport that you can use the information in it and it's still valid. And then you have to go and get a new passport. Um, and then the dbGaP permissions. In this case, there's only one permission shown, uh, but in practice, uh, a researcher who's been who's doing a lot with NIH might have uh, a couple dozen or of these um, that are particular studies that they've been granted access to, um, and so um, all of that will be included in this RAS dbGaP permissions list uh, in the custom claims section of token introspection. So. In practice, what this means for the CFDE user portal is that researchers can log in to the CFDE portal using any login provider that's available in Globus. They don't have to use the researcher auth service. But if you want to see your dbGaP authorizations, you do need to select NIH researcher auth service when you log in. Um, otherwise, it will basically say, we know that this you know, this particular data requires authorization, but we don't have your passport, so we don't know if you're permitted or not. Um, if you want to find out, then you'll have to log in with NIH Research or Auth Service and look again. Uh, what it does in order to handle that expiration time is that the portal automatically logs you out when your passport expires. Um, and as I noted right now, that's a 12 hour window. So in practice, most people will never notice that this happens. Uh, but the reality is that um, if you stay logged into the portal after logging in with RAS for more than 12 hours, you'll be automatically logged out and have to log back in again. So you can see that the heavy lifting, first of all, was done by RAS. Um, the NIH Researcher Auth Service collects all the visas from dbGaP and provides this very nice OIDC broker service, which gives us access to a passport, gathers all the information together, and makes it available through the OpenID Connect 1.0 interface. That's lovely. Um, but you can also see that there are some limitations right now in the integration that we provided through Globus. Uh, in particular, we're not providing data access uh, because we're diffusing the, the access tokens or basically removing the access tokens from the passport that's provided to the application. And also, um, in order to access the passport information at all, 
the researcher has to authenticate with RAS. So what are some future directions? Um, first of all, in the CFDE portal itself, we could improve things a bit. Um, some ease of use improvements are the ability to uh, interactively offer to enable dbGaP features with a RAS login if it isn't already enabled in the session. Right now, uh, you basically have to know that you need to log out and log back in with researcher auth service in order to turn the dbGaP authorization features on. It'd be nice if the portal was smart enough to say, oh, uh, we see here that you didn't log in with researcher auth service. Uh, if you want to see your permissions, here's a link. Um, and also, rather than automatically logging out after 12 hours, it would be better to prompt to reauthenticate with RAS um, and, and um, uh, make that be a little bit smoother experience. Um, finally, uh, a little bit looking forward a little bit farther. As the researcher auth service expands its login options, adds more in common providers, um, adds more social auth providers, we might consider enabling all of them in the Globus integration, not just limiting it to you have to log in with ERA Commons or a smart card, but rather, um, you know, you can log in with ERA Commons or login.gov or your in common provider um, or Google. Um, and basically allow all of them to be options, um, but then restrict the CFDE portal to only list the RAS options. In other words, don't list any of the other uh, identity providers that Globus knows about, only the ones that, that RAS provides. The benefit of that is that then all CFDE portals logins would have access to the RAS passport. Um, and researchers would still be able to authenticate with some in common IDs, um, some social auth IDs, login.gov, ERA Commons, et cetera. So that's one possibility. From the Globus point of view, uh, as, uh, as a uh, login service provider, um, well, one thing that one future direction would be to not diffuse the RAS visas, but instead leave those access tokens in the passport. Um, and allow them to be used to control access to data via Globus itself. Globus is a data um, data transfer service um, and data access service, and it would be nice if we could actually use the RAS visas to, as a way to control access. Um, and so we're considering uh, the possibility of that. The de significant downside to that is that that would then put Globus into the um, the category of services that have <laughs> services that uh, keep around these uh, access tokens and it is a significant risk. Uh, in other words, it, it would it would significantly increase the risk to the University of Chicago as the operator of Globus to be handling these active access tokens that could be used for access to human subject data. And we're not sure that we are um, quite there yet. Uh, we could also manage the passport lifecycle internally using the RAS refresh token to automatically um, uh, refresh the passport rather than um, having it time out after 12 hours. Uh, we could just, there's, there is a re refresh token that's provided by RAS and we could use it to um, essentially extend the passport indefinitely, although it might change over time. Um, and then um, also, um, Something that we're looking at in Globus is how, what is the right way to handle the RAS asserted identities that overlap with other OpenID Connect providers like CI Logon or uh, Globus itself or Google. Um, all of those services um, already assert identities for in common and edugain uh, institutions. If RAS starts asserting identities from those uh, institutions already, What's the right way to represent that to applications in Globus? Do we just pass it through and uh, ignore the fact that it was asserted by a different uh, provider? Or do we need to um, let the application know um, which, uh, which uh, authentication provider asserted the identity? Um, and then also we are exploring the possibility of uh, working with GA4DH to figure out whether it's possible for OIDC brokers to accept passport scoped access tokens issued by other OpenID Connect servers so that um, you can actually authenticate with one OIDC server, uh, get a uh, scoped access token from it, and go to the OIDC broker and get the passport. What kind of assurances are needed 
um, in the OIDC broker, there's probably a lot of um, assurances that need to be um, made between the OIDC broker and the auth service in order to make that possible. Um, and then uh, I think a very obvious uh, next step would be to support other GA4, GH, IDC, uh, OIDC brokers like Elixir, for example, which also provides an OIDC broker um, for the European community. Um, and so we would very much like um, Globus to integrate with that at some point. All right. Um, I think we might have time for a question or two. <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Um... A lot of detail there, but it's, uh, I, I appreciate you telling us the whole story because uh, it ain't easy to make it happen. Tom, do you have a question? Yeah, hi, Lee. It's Tom Barton. You know, I used to be your CISO. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm working with the NIH central IT people on the NIH login gateway, which uh, part of the conception is that that'll, that'll be the authentication service for RAS as well, ultimately. At least that's the one way they talk about it. It also seems that it might address some of the uh, Questions that you that you were raising about authentication, if it was aligned with, if it was identified, integrated with the login gateway, I think the user experience issues. Uh, it seems like there would be less duplication of effort to make sure that only qualified authentications are permitted in that sort of thing. You know, so the MFA is honored or whatever level of identity assurance is then, then asserted and so forth. So I don't know if you. Um, Maybe you and I, some some point, could talk about that uh, and uh -huh. just kind of compare notes. To see, because I know there's been some, you know, Brad is going to there's overlap with their independent activities. Uh, fine. Uh, also, been talking with uh, Tommy from Elixir about his concerns with uh, sharing passport data across brokers, and we nice asked to broker a conversation with some key people just to kind of go over what's what are the what are the difficult parts of that really. Yes, there are so many different moving pieces in this, um, and so I um, all I can really say is yes. <laughs> um, you know, there are there are a lot of uh, things that need to be ironed out in terms of assurances that are needed across organizations, uh, and also in terms of um, you know what what re what are the the nails and tax requirements for sharing um, visas uh, and and the data access tokens. Um, in this the system, and it's going to take a lot of talking moving forward. But I am happy that we at least have um, gotten to the point where NIH is running a very robust um, authorization service that we can use in something like the CFDE portal pretty easily. Actually, it wasn't that challenging for us um, to become a client of uh, RAS, and um, uh, so we're we're making progress. And at the very least, we are, I think starting to um, create motivation for those discussions to happen because we actually have applications that would benefit from um, new features uh, that like those yeah but also i think there's one other aspect that is for at least for all the uh, identity providers in the federation side and extra game communicating with them with their operators what the needs are for their researchers to access various things inside nih reducing the number of independent sources of messages and different requirements uh, would obviously be a, a big plus. If we can get it down to one, that would be perfect. Um, but so there's lots of time. Yes, and, and I, I, I should have, I should have said that in addition to the heavy lifting that NIH has done with regard to um, collecting visas from many data access committees and making them available through the RAS service, they've also done another set of heavy lifting, which is communicating authorization assurance requirements to in common providers um, and well, pretty much any you know anyone in the federated um, authentication space to say these are the requirements that we are going to ask you to, um, or these are the assurance requirements that we're going to. Um, place on you in order for you to be an authentication provider for our um, OIDC broker. Um, and that's been very helpful because we've seen universities um, enhancing their auth services to map, to, to map uh, I'm sorry, to um, satisfy those authentication requirements. And that's been very helpful. So NIH has been doing quite a lot uh, to make all of this possible. Brian, did you have a quick question, Brian Dockelman? Yeah. Uh... Two, two quick questions. One is, what's the cardinality of the number of visas 
somebody might have, and that, that is, does, does somebody have two, 20 or 20,000 uh, visas? And, and then second, uh, does the community view having all of visas appear in, in the same token as a potential privacy or security concern as opposed to you know requesting exposing just one one visa at a time for the, the data that's needed. Okay, so I can answer um, that in a couple different ways. Regarding the cardinality of how many visas will appear um, in a passport, as far as I know, that is uh, pretty much an open door right now in that it's or open ended um, in that um, I don't know of any limit there. Um, I do, however, know in practice that that um, DB Gap itself, as the the one provider that RAS currently uses um, for visas, um, has on the order of hundreds of studies. It is extremely unlikely that any any single researcher will ever get access to all of those studies. Um, there, that would be a just just to be very you know very simple about it. They would have to put in a lot hundreds of applications to data access committees to make that happen. Um, there is no kind of blanket, you know, you get access to everything. Um, and so it would just require an awful lot of work to do the applications to make that happen. So it's probably more on the order of dozens. Um, but having said that, um, dbGaP isn't the only game in town. Um, there are other um, uh, visa issuers. And so it could potentially be a very large number. And that is a concern that we have had in Globus um, when dealing with, um, with RAS um, and with the GA4GH spec in general. With regard to your question about privacy um, in the um, GA4GH passport, um, that is an issue that I imagine the GA4GH um, community um, needs to address um, because they are the um, originators of the specification that specified a, what a passport is. And I would, I, I am not part of that community, but I would be very surprised if that has not been a topic in the GA4GH uh, organization. Um, and so that would be the place that you would need to ask that question, I think. All right. Thank you, Lee. I uh, appreciate that. Yep. So we've been waving to our. Uh, our presenters instead of clapping since we can't hear everybody. Uh, and um, thank you for your presentation. We're going to move uh, forward with our uh, final session, um, uh, well, final presentation session here. Um, and I'm not quite sure who's going first there. Right yep. now. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, but before I do, um, we filled up the front page of the sign in sheet, but there's space on the back. Does anybody miss the sign in? Thank you. It's very helpful for having this meeting accepted at the summit next year. They show they had a good crowd. Didn't just leave the period yet, huh? Oh, there's an idea there. Um, so that was really uh, an excellent presentation by Lee, um, uh, which uh, I think uh, is a good lead into um, what I'd like to talk about. Talk more about JSON Web Tokens, of course. Um, so I'm Jim Basney. I lead the Seattle Icon Project at um, NCSA at the University of Illinois. And uh, we've been doing a lot with JSON Web Tokens lately to support different science applications. Uh, we uh, issue a lot of ID tokens through the OpenID Connect protocol for web applications. SIMA is an example of a research plan that we work with to ensure that the ID tokens contain the user attributes of root memberships that are specific to that research collaboration to enable appropriate authorization across the, the research collaborations um, uh, applications. Um, we also issue tokens called SI tokens that are capability-based tokens for access to data and other resources. These tokens contain scope values that um, include specific authorizations. Um, and so I'm going to talk a bit more about, um, about LIGO before handing over to Dave and Renee in the session. We've got Randy here to keep me honest and 
and uh, I'll also I'll sure LIGO or, or online to uh, to chime in if I say anything wrong about LIGO. Um, so uh, CLOGIN also supports uh, flavor of tokens called WLCG tokens for the uh, worldwide large hadron uh, glider uh, computing grid, um, and uh, so they uh, uh, support authorization scopes for storage and compute similar to side tokens, but also do group-based authorization similar to what we do in ID tokens. You can see how these things mix and match. And then uh, CL Logon also recently added support for g for dh passports, uh, which you um, got a great introduction uh, to the Lee. Um, and uh, so um, Lee explained how NIH is, is um, really offering great support for the GA for GH passports specification for EV gap and um, you know, US uh, genomics research um, and then Elixir is supporting uh, uh, genomics research in Europe. Uh, we're working with Australian biocommons to apply the standard in Australia. And so we want this all to be interoperable, interoperable with, with Globus, with the Globus points at different providers. So, uh, so we was really raising the uh, really uh, important topics there. Uh, also, want, now that Tom's back, I want to give an advertisement for Tom's presentation on Thursday about authorization, which is so critical to access to that NIH data and other genomics data. So I'm looking forward to that, that update from Tom on Thursday. So um, uh, these uh, JSON Web Token implementations all share a common foundation of IETF standards. So uh, we're using the OAuth 2 authorization framework that gives us the standard protocols for issuing the tokens for user consent, prompting the user uh, to approve issuance of the token to a particular application, which is important for, for privacy and for least privilege access to, uh, to data. And also, it includes those refresh tokens so that if you've got a long way session, if you've got a long workflow, these, these tokens can be, um, the, the lifetime of these tokens can be extended appropriately. And then the JSON Web Token RFC uh, uh, specifies how uh, we can interpret these um, token designed, cryptographically signed token documents in a, in a standard way, how we can validate the signatures without having to call back to the issuer because we can, we can read through that JSON document and verify the signature using the public keys of the issuer and do things in a, in a very distributed way, which is really critical for so much of our distributed computing and, and scientific computing. The OAuth authorization server metadata is an essential standard for how we can support uh, multiple token issuers in a distributed fashion so that all of our resources around the world have a standard way to look up the current public keys for the token issuers in, uh, in a way that's, um, uh, that's scalable and allows us as token issuers to uh, rotate those public keys or even revoke public keys if needed uh, for, for security reasons. The token exchange RFC is really critical for downscoping tokens, uh, dropping privileges of the tokens to get us that least privilege as the token travels through uh, a workflow that could be fairly complex in the, uh, for our different scientific applications. And uh, lastly, RC9068 is a profile for using these um, uh, capability authorizations in the scope plane of the token, and then making sure that the token has a specific audience so that it's not used in the wrong place, but it's uh, it's targeted to specific services in the, in the distributed computing environment or in the, in the research collaboration. So um, we always refer back to these standards as our foundation. We've got a lot of good security guidance included in the RFCs that, uh, that we need to make sure to follow. So uh, we've been working, uh, the CL Logon project has been working with LIGO on their migration from X509 certificates to tokens for authorization of data and services for, for a couple of years now. Uh, we operate a dedicated token issuer at CL slash LIGO, uh, but we're migrating to um, CL slash Igwin for the uh, international gravitational wave observatory network. What the Igwin stands for, because that is uh, that broadens the uh, 
access of the tokens uh, to include international partners um, Virgo in Europe, Agra um, in Asia. We, uh, we rely on a vault, the vault software that Dave will tell us more about shortly for token management. That includes token managing the refresh of the tokens, uh, managing command line access to the tokens. Um, uh, and, uh, so the, the vault server is a really key component here. And but uh, also for workflows and, um, and jobs for the environment, we uh, benefit from HD Condor and token management. HD Condor also has the ability to, to refresh the token. And so I'll talk about specific micro target applications that uh, we've been integrating token support with, including the, um, the OSG uh, Data Federation, which uh, builds on CBMFS and XUT data software. And then some LIGO um, applications, uh, gravitational wave data find, and DQ segment, which is about uh, segments of data from the uh, from the instrument, and uh, Grace DQ, which is also uh, about managing uh, uh, events from the, from the instrument. So, as part of the transition from the um, old LIGO issuer to the new AGWIN issuer, we're also rethinking some of our scopes and our authorization policies. And so I, I wanted to go over uh, the scopes that we've implemented for those uh, applications that I mentioned on the previous slide. So uh, members of the uh, Virgo LIGO uh, LAC, LSC collaboration have access to read those frames off of the instruments and to um, do queries against uh, GW data find. Um, and uh, also members of the CAGRA uh, group and can access that data. Um, we've got two groups because right now those are different identity management systems, but there's a project in progress to um, integrate those using um, open source uh, software called ComManage. Um, so that's going to help to, uh, to, to, to provide a more in, uh, unified authorization system for us. And then there's a uh, a much smaller group of systems that are authorized to write frames from the instrument. Um, and so there's some, a specific authorization group that controls that, and that's a scope that's um, not changing the transition. For the segment database, the um, LIGO, Virgo, Cobra members can, um, can query or read from the segment database and see where um, we're moving to a scope that uh, says uh, DQ segment you got read rather than having DQ segment in the path because it's the name of the service. It's not the path of the file system. It actually gives us the flexibility of, um, of doing finer grained uh, control using that path uh, element at the end of DQ segment you got read um, in the future. Uh, and then um, Smaller group of writers to the segment database has a, a dedicated authorization group, segment um, And then, uh, similarly, a uh, GraceDB, um, the members of the collaboration have read access to GraceDB, and we're making the, the same uh, transition for those scope values of the GraceDB. Um, but um, we've uh, we figured out that we don't need a write or a create. Scope for a race DB right now because that's just mm -hmm. by, by a very small group of people uh, using uh, service tackles directly in the circuit. We're also uh, doing a lot of work right now to support LIGO robots, which are unattended, long lived processes, which uh, you know, really do key computing and uh, data analysis. It's part of the scientific collaboration. So these robots. Um, have operators, but they also have their own identity. And we don't want these longer processes to be running with um, Jim Bassett's identity and all of, all of my privileges. It's, it's really its own separate thing. Um, and so we want to make sure that it has its own identity and its own uh, least privilege authorizations for, for doing the job that it needs to do. So uh, we uh, authorize the operators through an authorization group that says, here are the people authorized to um, endow robots with tokens. And so this, these are the, uh, this group says who's authorized. And then 
when one of those operators authenticates the CL logon and requests the token for the robot, CL logon looks them up in the group, says, yes, you're allowed to get tokens for that, uh, for that robot. And then a CL logon issues the token involved so that the robot can access it. Um, so as part of that authorization, uh, CL logon is also authored up, uh, verifying that the robot is authorized for those uh, particular scopes. And so maybe, uh, you know, again, the example of the Jim Dasney is authorized to, to read frames, but a robot doesn't need to read the frames. Then uh, if I request my token for the robot, CL logon is going to look um, up at this, uh, look up the scopes uh, accessible to the robot's identity and only grant those scopes to the token. Because the tokens will to vault, that means that um, vault can do the refreshing of the tokens, which is really critical for these robots because they're going to set their log in processes. And they have uh, Kerberos principles that they can use to interact uh, with vault directly so they uh, they don't require a mutual open ID connect uh, browser based on that. So um, we made a lot of progress. Um, uh, right now in LIGO, the CDMFS HD Condor integration with tokens is in operation. The GraceDB and, and GW Data Find token integration is implemented and being deployed. Um, and uh, QSecDB support and the robot support is under development. And we've been doing this work through uh, bi weekly coordination calls. With the target date of March 2023, that's when the LIGO observing run 04 is scheduled to begin. So we've got a we've got a bit of runway before us, but a lot of work to do between now and March. Um, and the vault, uh, as I mentioned, is a really key component. Um, Dave will be speaking next in providing really valuable uh, assistance to us in how uh, we're configuring vault in LIGO and, uh, and uh, how to. How to benefit from the, the power of the, the vault software. So, uh, okay, I, I don't want to steal too much time from Dave and Renee, but maybe I've got time for one or two questions. Questions for them, either online or from the group here before we switch. No, we're chewing too hard on what you just told us. So and you know where to find me. I'll, I'll yeah, we'll be around. Um, okay, Dave, are you, are you ready? Yep. Okay. I don't see the green window yet. Is it not? Is it showing up? Oh, it's the whole window, that, the whole screen. Yeah, you're getting the whole desktop. Oh, 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 I didn't did not intend to do that. Hold on. Can you also uh, raise the gain on your mic as much as you can so we can hear you better? Okay, let's see about that. That takes it. Either that or just talk longer. Talk loudly. Talk loudly. <laughs> yeah, uh, just a sec. I also. Uh, Raise the gain. <clears throat> uh, well, all right. <laughs> Computer is not behaving so quickly. So, okay, I'll just talk loudly, I guess. Thanks. Um, oh, it says that it's actually all the way up. So, okay. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not going to give a, an introduction to Vault here because I've uh, spoken in the last two uh, workshops on this. Uh, but here's just the background uh, is what I said on there. Um, so we use Vault to store OAuth refresh tokens, and then uh, it issues its own tokens to access those refresh tokens. And um, it in uh, Vault takes the place of my proxy in in, the, in our job submission architecture. Maybe other people are familiar with that with certificates. We would. Uh, hold a um, a long-term um, X509 proxy on behalf of users. We also use that here in Vault. And it's also the OAuth client in this architecture. We have a, a Vault client called HDGET token, and then a, a, um, a, a package that we use to configure Vault called HD Vault config. Those are two packages that I provide to use this. And then CI logon is the token issuer, and 
and uh, then you use H to get token for then for submitting jobs to, to Condor, and then Condor is used to uh, gets the tokens to access data, and we can also bypass Condor and just run commands directly to to do file transfers, uh, things that that uh, access the storage, for example. And uh, so we want to share the token uh, between both of those. So we have a thing set up so that the the user can either submit jobs or they can just run commands that will will trans access their data and we want to use the same token for that and um, then uh, also at, at last year i talked about the use of hd get token involved in, it's integrated in the hd condor system so um so what's new now is the still we don't we don't have any uh, vo in full production uh, Mene is going to talk some more about the, that status but uh, we have made advances in preparation for that. And uh, we have set up a, uh, uh, the authentication services group have, has, has set up our HA vault services, um, each with three VMs. And, and one of those services is, is expected to be used for production. Now we have it set up in, in being ready to use when we get to production. And there's a configuration generator for that vault, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And then um, we've also set up this managed token service that's a little more complicated. I'll also be talking about that to see how to make things a little easier for automation by experiments. And LIGO, which Jim talked about, is closest to the, the production use. Um, and um, as he said, they're working on the support for robot scripts, and I'm helping out, out with that. JLab also has been starting to use this infrastructure again so far in, a, in an experimental de deployment. They do have a uh, an HA vault service set up and uh, have uh, gotten uh, jobs submitted through H HD Condor and uh, also using CI logon. Okay, so the configuration generator, um, we have our own custom database instead of co-managed like what Jim was talking about with that, that uh, and, uh, and we have a, an interface to it and, we, and this, this system is called Ferry. And um, it describes all experiments as we have so many experiments uh, that we, uh, we support and members and lots of lots of people that co-managed really didn't scale for us. So we, ha we have our own and the roles people are authorized for and the token scopes that each role is authorized to receive. And then that writes out to the LDAP. I didn't mention that here, but that writes out to the LDAP, which um, CI Logon uses to know which which tokens to issue, but who's allowed to, to get which kinds of tokens and what roles, which scopes. So that's also, uh, so the HD vault config, which I mentioned that it works with YAML files, that's how it configures. And it, it's basically the main thing is this, it describes issuers, uh, which is not the same thing necessarily as a token issuer, we, um, and roles, and then each uh, role is associated with scopes. And um, the, uh, the the issuers we have, for example, some we have a Fermilab issuer that CI Logon has, and we has about twenty different sub uh, experiments with it. And so we we count inside a vault and this HD vault config. We count each of those their own issuer, even though it's only at one token issuer. As far as the users concerned, it looks like a separate one. And now, so HD Vault Gen, this is the new thing that I wanted to, to talk about today. Uh, it's just, it's, it, it reads information from Ferry frequently and then creates most of those YAML files that HD Vault config uses. So, uh, so this is, it's not a general purpose tool, but I just wanted to talk about it as a, a general concept that there may be uh, others maybe use. In fact, LIGO is talking about get, making a configuration generator for all their robots. And, um, it reads, uh, it reads its own smaller YAML files uh, describing information uh, like the, the issuer URL, the client ID and secret, and then also uh, where to read from Ferry. And then it reads from Ferry and generates all the, the YAML files needed for the for HD Vault config. And uh, so and it avoids having to ask these operators who are in a separate group. They're in part of the core computing. They run our author their SSO and things. Um, they don't need to know about all the different science experiments and that. That's all automatically configured for them. And it's only, it's not very big. It's just a bash script of 150 lines. So. And oh, and it does it does use this YAML to bash uh, converter uh, that's part of the HD Vault config uh, code. So that 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 that's uh, uh, just to be fair, that it's a little more complicated than just the bash script. But 
So now I'm going to talk about the managed token service. This is this is a fairly significant uh, piece of work. It's also not really general purpose, but the uh, that the uh, that the concepts might be useful to other people. Uh, it's really Fermilab specific, but uh, it replaces our, our managed proxy service that we had had already set up that made, that made X509 proxies basically for robots for, for lots of experiments at once. And um, it would store the, the longer lived proxies into, into my proxy for job submission to be able to refresh those proxies out into jobs. And so we were now doing the corresponding managed token service. I'm not the main developer of that, but I helped them get it going. And so, um, so then the operators of this uh, of service, they're, they're given permission by CL login via ferry um, to, uh, to request a refresh token for each of these managed accounts. So the operators of the managed token service, they are given permission, just like Jim was talking about, they're, who's allowed to get those robot tokens in the first place. They're the ones who are allowed the operators. So we don't have to have every experiment member know how to do this. We have a, a service that we provide to them. And, and then that operator runs HDGET token via this HD Condor script, uh, Condor Vault store. And um, so that way the corresponding log, the Vault token gets stored in HD Condor's uh, cred D and then HD Condor, I got a picture of this on the next page, it's kind of describing in words. Um, it gets stored in, uh, and that's where HD Condor uses it to refresh uh, tokens to from Vault access tokens to the job. And then, so then this operator logs into their web browser, they approve this operation, so they need to do it. And then they also obtain a Kerberos key tab corresponding to the to that storage location and vault for each experiment shared account. So the operators of this service do that. Then they're given permission to, to uh, uh, oh, in addition, they're given permission to write to the submit machines for each of these experiments. They each have their own virtual machines for submitting jobs. And then so they, they are given uh, SSH access to push the vault tokens to the places where those those accounts on, on the so job submit machines can use it. And they, they then also have an automated script that sends updated vault tokens to those shared accounts um, frequently enough until whenever they need to be renewed. And they, then those are used to get access tokens for submitting jobs and for, for transferring files, et, et cetera. So first of all, just think of the overall security design and the next page looks kind of daunting a little bit, but the, the overall design is that we want to limit which hosts are holding the unlimited life credentials because those are the ones that we worry about the most in the security, right? So we put, so we put, so we put in Vault the refresh tokens. Vault gets the refresh tokens. It's a, a you know highly secured. People don't log into it except the administrators. That's where we put the refresh tokens, which are effectively unlimited in life because they get re they're infinitely renewable every time they're used. And then we also have the managed token server, and that's the thing that has the Kerberos key tabs, which are unlimited life. Those are the things, the credentials that are unlimited life. So we put this managed token server and we um, only have a few people that are allowed to control over this. They're the ones that have the long limb, long lives uh, credentials, these two servers. So then now, so the, going through the whole, the whole uh, step, uh, the whole thing pretty quickly, uh, I'm gonna say, so the operator of the managed token process goes to when to start things off, they go to their web browser. Well, if they go to, they go, go to Vault first, uh, and then Vault tells them to go to their web browser and um, and the token issuer and all that through their identity provider, and it all ends up with Vault getting a refresh token for that's authorized, that's that's usable by by the out on the grid, and and also an access token, um, and and that's also the token issuer also sends access tokens to Vault whenever they're needed. Um, Vault does not generate any of those those tokens that are used on the grid. It does generate its own Vault token, though, just to use to, to communicate between it and its and its clients. So it then passes the Vault token to the managed token server, which is running this script called Condor Vault Store, which is part of the Condor. It's part of the Condor integration with, with Vault, and it calls HDGET token, uh, and that's what what communicates with Vault. So then the Condor Vault Store also pushes a Vault token, a, a longer lived one to Condor CredD. 
you know, which which uses uh, which is understood with Condor Credma and Vault is plugged into Condor Cred-D. And that stores, that's another uh, long-lived, it's not as long-lived, but it is effectively, these, these in effect get renewed infinitely, um, even though if someone steals, someone breaks into this and they get a Vault token, it, only, it lasts for 28 days. It's not un, unlimited, but if, but this one gets continuously renewed. It actually, we could we could use less than 28 days for this because it's renewed frequently. It just, that's the most convenient because that's the link that we need when a user themselves is submitting jobs. Um, so then in addition, this managed token server pushes a vault token to the job submission node. And uh, this again gets renewed uh, and um, whenever they need it, but this one is only a seven day one. And so if the submission nodes, which is more vulnerable uh, because a lot more people log into it, um, then uh, they would only get a week's worth of access. And mm -hmm. so then that gets used by Condor Vault Store there as well. well actually, the people call Condor Submit, which calls Condor Vault Store. The user goes there and then that uses that vault token to get access tokens. And that access token is just used to submit jobs. And you can also be used to, to access files. Uh, sorry about that. Ah, just wait till it stops, I guess. Hang up and they'll probably call back. Um, then, uh, then the, uh, but then what's important then, then is that the Condor SCED D renews the X. So these are only short lived. They're like a few hours, right? So they, they get renewed on the worker node. So if somebody breaks into the worker node, which is even more vulnerable, that's only gets three hours worth of access. So this is what I have. And if people have questions, uh, now's the time. Uh, I'll leave the picture up though. Well, I should get the, uh, do anybody have any uh, questions for Dave immediately? Or are you guys running the vault server on rel eight at all? Because it was working fine for me on rel seven, and when I tried to transition to rel eight, it broke. I haven't had a chance to go back and fix it yet. But just uh, curious. We, we are yes, our 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 um our uh, our production servers are using rel eight. Uh, so yeah, if you want some help with that, let me know. Okay. Okay. Anything else? I'm curious about the um, sort of the infinite uh, renewals on these. Uh, if you're doing that infinitely, what's the point of you know setting a period anyway, or what's the uh -huh. balance there? Yeah, uh, uh, which uh, which which are you particularly are you are you wondering about in Vault or in in, in the you know which infinite renewal are you talking about? Because well, the, the answer is different. You know, the answer is different. Yeah. Answer. Okay, so I guess uh, everything is you know within context, mm -hmm. and how do you manage that with Vault? Okay, well or, the the the, 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 the refresh that. token, the refresh token by its, itself. Well, really, you know, if someone broke into Vault, they'd have to have they'd steal the client ID in secret and the refresh token. Those three things together, those don't. You know, and especially if nobody noticed it, um, those those by themselves can be used continuously to renew. Whereas these other ones are, the idea is that if somebody just steals it once and then is, and then can't get any more, then they're more limited, right? So, and the further out we go into exposure, the more limited we make it. So. Right, so so here uh, the managed token server, you know, there we figure that's a very very tightly controlled machine. It has an unlimited credential. It is only it's limited to only a specific location in Vault, but um, uh, and as, as far farther you go out, then uh, you know this submission node is a lot more exposed. It's, it's following the same rules that the that proxies that we follow, we follow the same rules that. That, that were made by the IGTF for proxy saying any user credential should not be stored unencrypted for more than 10 days or some certain number of hours and minutes. Okay, so we're trying to follow that. So that the vault token there, even though in this case it gets renewed constantly, uh, if any one that gets stolen, it would only be good for a week. And, and likewise, the access tokens, because it is so exposed and worker knows all over the place, we want to make those really short. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, if you needed to revoke 
uh, access to a system on the fly, would you work from the end backwards, or what's the what would the playbook look like? Yeah, I we I mean vault tokens can be revoked. Uh, we probably don't worry about that so much. Uh, I don't think we haven't really hardly worried about that because they're they're they are more limited in life we we do go through then you know to the token issuer if we want to revoke that refresh token our client id in secret uh, so yes i i would think we would never worry about revoking an access token because they're so short-lived jim might have more to say about this uh we have more questions go ahead um so i just so this occurred to me just while you were talking dave um just in terms of security for particularly the vault server itself so at the last EU Grid PMA meeting, we were talking about how we can use AEOPS to um, look at securing the token issuers or the, you know, the identity proxies. And I'm wondering if it would make something, make it make, sorry, it would make sense to some, sorry, I'll try that again. I wonder if it would make sense to consider something similar for the Vault server, particularly because it's the most risky. I don't, I don't know what you, I didn't follow what you said. The AOPS. So AOPS is a as a um, applying a set of authority operations. That's right. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, I should have said. So so um, applying a set of standards for how services are provided, um, mm -hmm. how they're deployed, etc. And I'm wondering <laughs> if it would be worth considering something something like that for the Vault server. Um, I think nothing nothing outlandish but just as a you know mm. this is how we deal with this because it's an important component. yeah yeah i mean we we treat it the same as our sso you know um it's the same group of people that are that are doing this they're you know they're making sure that it's a very limited number of people and the people know that they're you know how to how to securely manage things that's that's the limit we're not doing things like uh hardware uh hardware uh what do you call them the I mean, the, the token issuer themselves would protect that key, that that vital key is is uh, is stored on hardware, right? Um, so, but we don't have anything that strong inside Vault, but it's it is still a very vital piece of the security infrastructure. That's true. No, but... absolutely, no, absolutely. And I think it's just it's just this is the assurance part of mm -hmm. these are important parts. Therefore, we've got this is this is how we handle it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, this picture looks awfully complicated, but. Uh, there's there's, there's a method to all the madness so. aren't refresh tokens supposed to cycle and only be singly accessed so if you had an external actor that, that used the access token they'd be basically stealing it from your processes you immediately know that it's compromised and you could intervene at that point wait i i, I didn't understand you we were talking about both refresh well, and access it, well my, okay I, I have limited understanding but my understanding is that refresh tokens are cycled every time you actually activate a refresh token you get a new one and it can that's only right. be accessed once so that means no that's not actor that's, took that you know not that exactly mm, only if you were watching the watching closely for ip addresses that we weren't expecting Cause you're, cause you're, um, you're no, because you're because they could get a new one. No, I, okay. Here's the thing too. I see. We I understand your question now. But actually, no. We we have decided that refresh tokens are going to be. We're not going to immediately revoke them when they're replaced uh, because because of this is something a recent discussion in the WLCG authorization working group that we're not going to immediately revoke the refresh token let them last for like another day or so because because of possible hardware failures it's possible that during the exchange that you know the token issuer thought they issued a new one and and but that the but the vault the client doesn't has didn't actually get it because of a network failure or whatever. So we don't want to immediately revoke them. It's actually, I think, the current implementation, but we're going to change that. To, so I see what you mean, but yeah, that that someone might reuse it, try to use one, and it's already been replaced. But um, there, it will be, yeah, it will be possible to have have more than one uh, in, in in active at a time. Yeah. Anybody else, or should we move on? We're already yeah, let's move on. Um, beyond our time, so that's okay. We we do we have more to present? Mine is still up. Yeah, let's yeah. Uh, Mine, if you're ready. Yeah, okay. I will just 
I hope you can hear me. I'm gonna start sharing just a second. Huh? Yeah, if you can try to speak loudly for us, we have a small Oh yeah, speaker. I will. Thank you. Okay, can you see it? Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so I am going to, you know, it's sort of like a continuation of Dave's talk, um, but I'm going to give a more of a, a general overview and the status update from what we're doing at Fermilab's identity project. So let me just jump in. So I gave a talk here last year and uh, you know, I, I want to first refresh people's, again, it was a status update. It was a little bit more detailed, huh? but I want to just refresh people's little bit, you know, memories. So in the last talk, we presented our complete architecture diagram. We said that we reported that we finished almost all of our software development. I mean, as you heard from Dave, there are still bits we've been doing, but they were, you know, most of it was, was finished. Uh, we, at the time last year, you know, we were getting prepared to move our software into production. We were getting ready to build a token issuer instances. We needed five of those for our international VOs. Um, at the time, we were just creating a task force with our experiment users, their experiment members, so that we can start testing our tools and services. And, and I think at the time we just have done like very really basic test of obtaining a token with the correct privileges and basically able to show them that. So that's where we left off last year. So I'm gonna, hopefully you guys will remember a little bit of it, but I'm just going to, you know, move ahead from that. So what happened is what's our current status is, we moved all of our software services into production. CI log on theory, they are both in production. Walt is, all, I mean, it, it is in production now. I mean, you know, we, we had three instances, dev, test, and prod, and prod has been moved into production very recently, but all of them are in production now. And, and we are inviting our experiment members to test with these, you know, production services. So I will talk about that a little bit more. Um, all of our international VOs along with the Fermilab VO. So we have the international VOs like Dune, and MUTE, they will get their own token issuers, but we also have a Fermilab VO that's more of an umbrella VO for our other experiments, maybe smaller experiments, we can call them. And, and we will have one token issuer for that too. So we will have multiple token issuers. Um, Dune and MUTE were among our first testers. So Dune was able to submit jobs with tokens successfully. So they demonstrated it. Again, this was a basic job submission, right? It wasn't a very complicated workflow, but still, you know, they were able to submit jobs, able to access the storage and run a simple job. Mu2E, that's our another experiment. They've been also running test jobs. They had um, they they were actually able to run jobs, but they just discovered some issues accessing the storage. And, and currently we are working on these. It's some of our privilege issues and basically how we define the scopes. And, and I think it's it's either resolved or really, really close to being, being finished right now. We have another experiment called Annie. They were able to run tests with successful, but they also again run into some storage issues. So we are also working with them right now, trying to fix that. And actually that was also very close to being resolved, I believe. So in general, what we do is we are, we are focusing more on testing, as you can tell. So we are inviting our user community. Initially, we just invited um, some of the experiment members that are more you know, computing oriented, they're more familiar with this to test it, but soon, you know, once those tests, we are, we are, you know, debugging problems, we are finding issues. Once those have been, you know, sorted out, we're going to invite more on larger and larger user communities, even people they are not very familiar with these things. And let's see, you know, how they are going to be able to submit jobs and access data. So that's, that's really a priority for us right now. So the transition status is, um, you know, the, the, our main, almost main job submission system, job supply, it's going some uh, changes of its own and it's, it's, it's also doing some tests right now. But once those tests also complete successfully, 
we are going to invite more of, more of our experiments to submit their more complicated normal workflow jobs. So that's, that's one of the things we are just looking forward to. Um, another really important test for us is, um, you know, being able to submit jobs with both proxies and the tokens. This is very important to us because uh, some of you may be aware of it, but we have, uh, you know, our schedules are, are different between WLCG and Fermilab. We have a little bit of a more accelerated schedule at Fermilab. So we expect that when we make our transition, many of the WLCG sites will not, they will still be using the, the proxies and certificates. So, to make sure that you know the one of the solutions we can find is whenever we submit a job, we're going to submit both proxies and tokens with the idea that hopefully when the job goes using our resources, it will just use the tokens. And then if it ever needs to access other WLCG resources, then the proxy will, will handle them the access. So one of the things in this test is definitely we are going to try to access storage in WLCG sites to see if the proxies will be handled correctly. So that's very important to us. And I know this is something that WLCG is also really keen to see that how this test goes. Um, again, you know, the, the schedule differences are very important because we are very worried that some of, you know, many of our REOs are international. And, and for example, we are in particular, we are more uh, watching out for the FTS and Rusio. Um, according to the WLCG timeline, they will not switch until 2024, but, you know, there's a, you know, we will be doing the transition by then, right? And, and for example, Dune and other wheels, they will, they, they use these services, so we don't want them to negatively impact it by this. We don't want the VO to basically have two separate infrastructure. One is already moved on to tokens, the other one is still with proxies and they cannot talk to one another. Definitely, this is not something we would like. So that's why we will in particular test these services also with proxies and the tokens together to make sure that you know the services can handle whatever whatever credentials they need, the services would be able to just pick them up and authorize based on that. So that's really important. Um, the, again, the other thing is, you know, we're looking forward to, we are slowly shifting our focus is uh, our transition from testing to transition. We started a little bit also thinking about that. Yes, we are still very much in the testing, but we also need to think about our uh, next steps. So one thing definitely we will need to put more effort into is documentation for both of our users and the, 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 the site admins. Um, and, and this needs to be very you know, detailed documentation. And another thing is the contingency planning. This is actually uh, mainly for the project that, you know, what happens if the test fails? For example, if, for example, for whatever reason, we are not successful with sending both tokens and, and certificates. Are we gonna continue with transition? Are we just stop it? You know, what's our thinking? You know, I, I would like to have that planning for that too uh, and and there are other cases that like you know that will fall under this you know uh, what if you know uh, some other major issues in the infrastructure how, how are we going to roll back to transition you know we need to we need to think that through that's what i mean by contingency planning and another thing is you know and and, and i think they've a little bit touched upon this or implied it is the the risk assessment that will also become a much more important part of our um project focus so, you know, we have a lot of tokens with various different lifetimes and, and uh, we need to really think about like what happens if one of the tokens are compromised or what happens if one of the services is compromised. You know, basically in, in, a, in a typical risk assessment, we would like to think that th these scenarios through and, and, and as Dave answered, some of that is maybe it's obvious to some of our, you know, for, for, for a few people who were in the project, but we also want to capture that on paper that, you know, these are the answers and that's how we're going to deal with these situations if they ever, huh? if they ever happen. So um, basically that's all my talk. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Huh? Thank you, Mene. Uh, mm -hmm. Does anybody here or online have any questions specifically for Mene? Thank you for that update. Uh, I know it's been an awful lot of work you've been uh, doing in this transition as in, and as you understand more of what you're learning 
mm -hmm. in the field with actually making this happen for a large worldwide uh, interoperable uh, environment. Um, we look forward to hearing more about what you learn and if only so that when we're ready to make the mistakes, uh, mm -hmm. we heard it from you first. Mm -hmm. um, and so we thank you for your presentations, all three of you. Uh, Sam, Dave, and, and uh, Manet, thanks again. Um, we have about a half an hour left. I don't know if everybody's exhausted, but if you have uh, uh, pressing questions on your mind for any of our presenters today that uh, may still be online, please uh, let me know. Anybody have some thoughts that occurred to them after the presentations this morning? That uh, I have one from, from from the first presentation from Kit. Um, you mentioned using the RePEDS assurance framework or the assurance information that can be factored into the authorization decision. And I noticed that uh, when you're scrolling on by, there were some RePEDS assurance kind of statements there. So my question was, do you have any use cases, any project or VOs that are supported that have uh, requirements involving that kind of insurance kind of information? Diana, are you able to respond to that? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize it was for me. Um, well, no, we don't know who would use that, actually. I mean, there are a few proxies that support it, but like um, the Helmholtz AI, that's a German project that I'm part of. Uh, but yeah, the service has to actually support it, and we don't know anyone who does it so far, but... Okay, so the plumbing, if the plumbing is kind of there. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it is there on the proxy and on some of the uh, home IDPs. Right. In Exceed, we had a, a common requirement for SSH to enforce multi-factor authentication. Uh, so that, as, uh, that aspect of assurance, the authentication of assurance, getting that MSA, Assertion in there, I think, would would be applicable for our SSH usage. Uh, except, uh, you know, that's a, that's a it, with the refetch approach. That's a common, a little bit different than the other assurance claim. Right. It's not a claim; it's something different structurally. However, uh, it's something I wonder. Uh, thinking back to the uh, the blueprint uh, proxy architecture, if there should be something incorporated into it in terms of MFA signaling, for example. Or possibly other kinds of assurance information signaling to make a more harmonious platform as those needs arise or where those needs arise that they, people would have to invent those solutions in a bespoke manner. That would be uh, that would be of interest to hear about. And and I think just I think just to add so I think um I think it was discussed at the last Indigo I am workshop a couple of weeks ago and it's something we've talked about as well is um um so for example in, in UK Iris the um being able to technically express assurance from particular IDPs that you could then make choices about at the service level um, would be very useful. Brian, did you have a question? But not a, a comment on the, the assurance thing. Um, so, so for for OSG, uh, you know, what, one thing we found with you know single sign-on and you know federated IDs is it it's fairly exclusive of uh, underprivileged schools, uh, you know. So, for example, we we held a training in in Africa, and exactly zero of the uh, people who attended the the African training were at a university that you know was part of Edugain or any of these. Uh, so, once we have a in person contact with an individual, and for any of the accounts, require at least a a Zoom discussion with video on. To, to meet the person, uh, we tend to be more permissive for, for folks that are from institutions that, that don't, you know, in, in terms of accepting kind of this more of the social network, GitHub, Google providers, uh, if they're from an institution that doesn't have uh, single sign on capabilities or, or parts of federations. And uh, if we have, we, we kind of can make that decision on, on base by base. So but at least for us, kind of in terms of assurance, the the upfront meeting with Zoom video on 
uh, covers that, then I think it helps be a little more inclusive of, of folks who might be from smaller institutions. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think also some of the refed, actually the refed assurance framework is undergoing revision right now. <clears throat> I'm one of the ones who's working on that. Uh, and in particular, I think you might find that if you if you if you decide that you want to uh, assess your kind of uh, let's say your ad hoc procedures to know if there are any what what if you know how how what kind of claims from a reset reset assurance framework perspective you could issue on the basis of what you're currently doing or if that wasn't satisfactory what tweaks you might make to your current process to achieve some goal that's something that might be worth looking at too looking at if you have any concerns about how well that's working, or if there are other parties outside of OSG who might want to leverage what you're doing, and they might have some concern in our way, you know, you to understand how well it's working and what level it's working. So there's a measure you can you can you'll be able to apply to your own process. But I understand what you're saying; it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Oh, cool. Thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> I was just sorry. I was just uh, uh, as I coded to that because just to to sort of I guess finish my talk from before because part of this for us came from. Um, as we were developing the, the policy framework for IRIS, that we were trying to set like an exact an, an acceptable assurance policy, but then it's like, well, we can't because it's service dependent and community dependent. So, so then, yes, so then it's basically technically so you can't trust. Yeah. And where does um, you know, I don't know what authorities to trust. Where, where, where do we have uh, beyond maybe IGTF an opportunity to have um, somewhere for issuers to assert their level of insurance uh, to some standards? Do we? Is it? Are there other places? I mean, I'm. We're hearing within, for example, NIH has got some process to decide what they're trusting or assert that these are the trusted ones and that's how what you're going to use. But in the broader science community, is there is there a need still or or are there gaps where that where we're just too insular and separating separated still and still trying to solve our own localized problems? Uh and people see not making any sense. I was just trying to think about the because we, we we talked about this at the at the CERN meeting. And I think they I mean I think I'm trying to think back. I think the discussion there was was at least as much about if you were going, you know, even even going back to the sort of initial practical element of if you were going to express a set of trusted issuers, how would you do that and where would you host it? And mm -hmm. um that sort of enabling technical layer that then lets you make the other choices because it seems likely that just different communities will just have different sets of issuers, broadly speaking. Um, the ones they care about, basically. Yeah. It'll be small enough that they'll just talk to each other instead of trying to. I guess there's that first, you know. Where are there attribute authorities I can trust? You know, is that even a question that comes up? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, All right, well, we have you. Go ahead, please. So I just wanted to um, say a little bit about what we've seen in Globus um, with regard to assurance re requirements. Um, one is that um, in the last year or two now, um, we, have, we have encountered people who are using Globus as high assurance um, subscription um uh, tell us that they need to be able to um enforce mfa for access to their high assurance collections and so we did that for them by um using the the ref eds claims um, that are available um and uh so basically that means that in order to access a collection that's configured in that manner um the the researcher who is trying to access the collection needs to authenticate uh, with a auth provider, with an identity provider that um, provides the RefEd's claims, um, and so it's not really so much that, that 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 MFA was performed as much as those claims are there <laughs> in the authentication. Um, and as was mentioned before, um, there is an issue here of um, 
you know, what types of organizations actually have the wherewithal to run an identity provider that can provide um, those claims and can provide MFA um, and, and do it in a trustworthy manner. But I also wanted to throw out a little bit of a twist. Um, we have also more recently than that, had people come to us and say, you know, it's not so much MFA that I need. I want to know that the identity provider, I want to be, I want to, I want to accept as many identity providers as possible, but I want to know that they're real identity providers. Um, and MFA is not the signaling that I need. Um, we've had people say things like, I'll take anybody who comes from a .edu. Um, you know, any, any IDP that's registered in DNS under .edu or under .edu and gov or under any of this list of a dozen, um, you know, top level domains, uh, for example. Um, and we're a little, we're a little bemused by this, frankly, uh, because I don't know that any of those are really guarantees that the IDP um, is any more trustworthy than anything else. But um, I just wanted to throw out there that there is an addition to MFA, which is one kind of assurance that is important for a certain number of use cases. We're also hearing from people that they would like to be able to use a lower level of assurance, which basically is, you know, I really, I can trust that this person really is somebody from that particular institution. Um, I can trust that institution to assert their identity. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, issue that has not been resolved yet in terms of how to provide that level of assurance. Um, and I would really be thrilled to find out if anybody is working on, um, on that kind of assurance. Um, basically the trustworthiness of the identity provider, not so we much in, in their authentication. Within in common, is that part of your integration? Yeah, we've the... also had people say, we've also had people to say, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we, we only want to accept authentications from in common um, IDPs. Um, or in common and edugain IDPs. Um, and that's a little bit better, I think, but it's still not 100% clear to me exactly what that gets you. And so it would be nice to have a crisper statement of what does it really mean from an assurance point of view um, for um, an IDP to be registered with in common? Um, you know, is that a guarantee of something? And if so, what? Absolutely. Um... One suggestion would be to take a look at in common's baseline expectations program. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not that addresses the kind of lower level assurance you're talking about, but it seems like it's in the ballpark. I also note that Refeds has also developed a corresponding almost identical set of yes. baseline expectations. And there's now a variety of processes underway to over time implement them across other national federations around the world. That'll be a long time before the last one is done, but nonetheless, it's, it's very encouraging that there's a lot of progress and a lot of uh, shared commitment to achieving that objective. So yep. see if that's, I, I'd, be, I'd be curious about your feedback uh, from the point of view of the kinds of requests you've been getting and how well this might or might not address some of those. Um, yeah, those are both, kind of, yeah. both great suggestions, well, thank you. And also, the, in terms of the NIH and their identity assurance and multi-factor assurance requirements, they are either, they, they basically are doing, have a choice of two. Either the refund standards, which is what they're requiring abroad because they have so many international extramural researchers, basically, uh, or the NIST standards. Uh, essentially, all the systems that Lee was talking about earlier have a FISMA moderate risk uh, classification. And when you go through all the federal NIST standards, you know, all the all the executive, all the all the machinery around them, they end up have to have MFA and they have to have identity assurance level two at the end of the day. Uh, very few exceptions. Uh, now, implementation of those requirements is by fits and starts, and you know, it's far from um, perfect. Uh, so but those are those are what they're dealing with. For internal purposes, they're using the NIST standards. For extramural purposes, they're using the refit standards. Thank you very much. Um, am I missing any other questions online from folks? Uh, or any of the presentations we've had today? Or uh, Just a quick note that we have the Slack as well, so we can continue discussion there, I guess, or Thank any you. other points to follow up on. If you don't. 
Um, well, I'd just like to thank uh, all of our uh, presenters today from uh, across the seas and across the internet and here in the room and uh, everybody who's participated today.